Let's see. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, everything's on. All right. Let me get my tea brewing. Steeping, I mean. Boop. Because we're at 9.51, my tea will be done. And it's going to get into this. So, Korea's most hated man just released from prison decided to move into a big Tosa neighborhood. It's gonna be a crazy one, <clears throat> I'm sure. Let's go. Bada bing, bada boo. December 16th, 2021. It's 9 p.m. in Ansan City, just outside of Seoul, South Korea. Mr. C receives a knock on his door. He looks through the little peephole. It's a uniformed police officer. He looks at his wife and says, it's the police. Now, to most couples, this would have been very alarming to have the police show up unannounced at your house at 9 p.m. on a Thursday night. Like, what is going on? But Mr. C was kind of in a strange situation. Someone tried to kill him earlier that year. So the officer was likely here to give Mr. C an update on the stalker that tried to kill him just 10 months ago. And, you know, the whole thing was really bizarre. A 20-year-old man, a complete and utter stranger to Mr. C. Like, they had no degrees of connection. They didn't have mutual friends, nothing. This man stalked Mr. C for three months, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. February of 2021, just 10 months ago from that date, he had slipped a knife into his pocket, buried his face into a giant puffer jacket, and tried to get into Mr. C's apartment building. He was caught with the knife in his pocket before he could even get to Mr. C. But the whole thing was just so unsettling. He was That's dragged away <coughs> from the police, and he was screaming about how- Hey, friend, what's up? Kill him. How you doing? Yeah, I was watching a true crime video before I do some Honkai. But yeah, how you doing? It's been a while. Must kill Mr. Yeah, C or else life is not worth living. And just to clarify, again, this is not a man that Mr. C even knows. Anyway, this man was sentenced to six months in prison. And it was just very terrifying for Mr. C to realize that there were people out there these days that have zero morals, zero concept of consequences. 
Build their new sign went on. What is it on? Like, what's, what subject is it? Hope it goes well. English. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's annoying. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Hopefully that goes well for you. But at least Mr. C had the police, you know? They've been very understanding about the whole incident. Old they poetry. Making sure to just... Like, the worst is, like, the Shakespearean stuff. Like, I don't remember much of it, but it's crazy. You know, Shakespeare made up a bunch of words that are still used. Like, um, the word vomit. He created it. He coined that word. The Shakespearean stuff. I remember reading like Othello, Othello Shakespeare, I think so. It was that kind of time period, I think. But yeah, he, he created a bunch of words. Um, and some of them, many of them actually are still used. Yeah, he did. The, the word vomit, I think, either crocodile or alligator, one of those he made. Because there just, there wasn't a lot of, the, he was writing about stuff and they didn't have that word in English yet. Um, or he wanted to phrase it a different way. So the vomit, I know he made. Oh, well, my English teacher told me back in high school that we that he made that one. Um, I forget if it was alligator or crocodile, but he made a bunch of different words. Um, for the English language, a lot of them are not used or used differently now, but some of them like he was so used today. It's crazy. Oh, wait, not vomit. I think it was puke. It was either puke or vomit. I don't think about it. I think it's puke. But we got one of those he made. That's crazy. Got my tea. Yeah, it's like, I mean, and maybe it seems kind of weird, but we're still, like, we're doing that now. Like, the concept of making up words seems really crazy, but it's happening. All the time, like the new um, lingo and stuff, like like Riz and stuff. Like, well, I mean, going back even further, Lit, Riz, all that stuff is like new. Technically, it's new words. Um, they're derived from old words, but they're still new things. Um, and like a hundred years from now, which words will we still be using? Because remember. Which one was it? Um, Ayo. A lot of people say Ayo. Um, and that used to be as an old school thing. That was like 80s, 90s, and then it stopped and then had a resurgence. Um, so that's really interesting to think about because when I was like really, really young, I heard people saying Ayo a lot. What's this? Um, but then no one said it. That what the heck? Adobe, get away. But then, like in a, a couple years ago, it started having a big resurgence. So I was like, I mean, yeah, I say it too, but I always said it because I said it when I was really young. Um, I heard it a lot when I was really young. But then, all of a sudden, everybody else started saying it. So it was like, it was kind of, it's kind of weird for a second. But it's interesting how this linguistic because it's interesting. Oh. Uh, different phrases and different meanings of things change over time but yeah so English is not all that but it's annoying to study for for exam for sure this is hot it's so pretty hot but yeah like every year well so many different things like the whole, what is it? I forgot the whole phrase, but you know, like Skibbity and Ohio, all that stuff is like, it's like the what Gen Alpha, Gen Alpha. It's like their whole thing. It's funny to listen to. Oh, that was pretty all right. Yep, yeah, Skibbity to it. Beth, um. I read most of Macbeth. I don't think we end up finishing it. Maybe. I can't remember. But yeah, remember those. 
But yeah, that's just like the the new. Yep. Yeah, I mean that's that's what they're doing now. What else? Oh, yeah. That's just how it is. It's really cringe. It is. Okay, never mind. Yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty weird. Nah, I mean, I, I feel alright. I just, I just cringe. Um, I don't know one, know anyone like in my actual like personal life that actually just says that stuff seriously. Like, if I ever hear it IRL, it's like making fun of it. But it's still pretty weird. Always interesting seeing what else comes. What comes next? Me. Check up on Mr. C. Trying to make him feel as safe as possible. Even stationing police guards outside of the building. Mr. C and his wife ushered in the police officer. They're like, it's 43 degrees. Come on, it's cold. It's cold. No, it's unclear if Mr. C recognized yeah. the officer. And it's that's yeah. That's what I'm like. Like Skibdy and stuff. They don't. They say it to either like. They say it ironically to like. Um mess with the other like older people <laughs> like my bicep hurts i can't even lift up my tea without a hurting yeah actually i do know people that say uh, that say like rizzler and stuff like seriously but not like skivity and stuff like that Set. Interesting. But yeah. Cool stuff, cool stuff. But yeah, I hurt my, when I didn't hurt my bicep, it's just really sore right now. Oh man. So picking up this cup of tea isn't stable. I feel like I'm gonna spill it. But it's good tea. Yeah, it's Japanese sencha. Big mug? This is, is not. Like, it's my hand. It's actually a pretty small mug, actually. Irish tea? I'm gonna try that sometimes. That sounds good. But it's just, I can't bend my arm. I to like lean towards it. Really? It's like one of the smallest mugs I have. I have well, berries tea. I heard berries tea is. I remember hearing that name. Berries tea. Berries tea. But I guess this is one of the smaller mugs. But I guess I have a lot of big mugs. Oh well, I mean, I mean you might be comparing it to a teacup. Teacups are definitely smaller. Berries tea. Um, any. Let's see if I can pick some up sometime. Yeah, definitely like trying different kinds of teas. It's unclear at what point Mr. C realized this police officer standing in his apartment is not a real police officer. He was the 20-year-old man that That's tried to nice. kill him 10 months ago. He had been released from prison four months ago, and he was back to finish the job. The fake police officer grabs a hammer near the door and smashes it onto Mr. C's head. Mr. C's wife is screaming. She's running out the door while the two men get into a struggle. They're trying to overpower each other. Mr. C's wife is screaming, there's a lunatic trying to murder my husband. Nice, the nice. Police officers arrive and Definitely check it out. Time. They arrest the masked man and Mr. C was rushed to the local hospital. The 20-year-old man did not have the best aim, so Mr. C ended up being yeah. completely fine. Just minor injuries, but he was okay. very badly shaken up. And the police Second to focus. I'm sorry. Manually focus it. Say, what is your problem? You don't even personally know this guy. Like, why are you ruining your life right now? You're about to get sentenced for attempted murder. Do you understand that? The guy with the hammer just bluntly responded, I'm doing this for justice. Justice? Can you really argue that justice is a 20-year-old man impersonating a police officer, breaking into a 70-year-old man's house and beating him on the head with... Yes, this is real. It's a real case. The hammer, that's a senior citizen. What's crazy is, everyone in South Korea, all the netizens, all the civilians, they agreed. This, in fact, was justice. Even the police couldn't help but agree. Maybe this is the way it's supposed to be. Because 13 years ago, a little girl had drawn a picture in court. It looked like the drawing of an 8-year-old, because she was 8 when she drew it. And the content of the drawing is pretty alarming. It's of a man standing in a jail cell. There are cockroaches just crawling around. There's rats everywhere. The man is holding a spoon in one hand, a bowl of cockroaches in the other. 
that's what he's eating. He's eating a bowl of cockroaches like it's cereal. And on top of his head, there is a judge slamming the hammer down on his head. That man in the eight-year-old's drawing was Mr. C. Cho Tu Sun Jun. He was the man who was on trial for kidnapping said eight-year-old girl, dragging her into the church bathroom, brutally essaying her within an inch of her life, mutilating her body, leaving her with permanent disabilities. And just 12 years later, he was released from prison, living as a free man, and not just free, living half a mile well, away. That got dark from the very prison. fast. Cho Tu Sun Jun is the most hated and yet the most protected man in all of South Korea. The man that the government has spent over a million dollars of taxpayer money to protect. The man that has strangers wanting to kill him for what he did to the little eight-year-old girl named Nayeon. This is the case of Cho Ju Sun, also known in Korea as the murderer of souls. He is also the most hated man in the nation. Whoa. We would like to thank today's sponsor for making it possible for Rotten Mango to support Rain, which is the nation's largest anti-violence organization. They have created and operated the National Essay Hotline, and all resources for that will be linked in the show notes. They work in prevention, resources for survivors, as well as bringing perpetrators to justice. This episode's partnerships have also made it possible to support Rotten Mango's growing team of dedicated researchers and translators. And we would like to thank you guys, our listeners, for your continued support as we work on our mission to be worthy advocates of these causes. As always, full show notes are available at RottenMangoPodcast.com. We had our Korean researchers work on the gathering of the data for this one. But as always, with any case, but especially the international ones, let us know if there's anything that's been miscommunicated, lost in translation, or any additional details that you may know. Please leave it down in the comments. Now, a very quick content warning with today's episode. There is a lot of heavy discussion on essay against an eight-year-old, and the perpetrator basically gets away with it. If that is something that you feel is going to be too heavy or is going to bring you to a very dark place, please take care of yourself, grab yourself a hot meal, relax, and I will see you next time. This is going to be a heavy one. Said, let's get into it. When the president comes to town, it's kind of a huge coordinated effort to keep the president safe. That's what this felt like. There's workers on ladders installing more CCTV cameras up on the poles. Street light bulbs were being taken out and replaced with brighter bulbs to illuminate mm -hmm. the alleyways at night to make right, it brighter. Right. Facial recognition cameras were being installed. I mean, those are expensive. Alleyway alarms were being installed. So if you're walking down the alleyway and you feel like, ooh, this doesn't feel right. Something sinister is about to happen. What do you do? You run to the pole, press the big red button. Police will be dispatched. There were countless bright yellow vests wearing police officers just roaming around the city of Anton, surveilling the people, civilians, poking their head into businesses, making sure everything is in order. The government actually spent money hiring martial arts professionals to train the police department better. The control room for all of the CCTV cameras in Anton City, it looked like a top secret military command center. Over a million dollars was spent in, like, the span of a month or two, revamping the streetlights, installing more cameras, even just hiring more manpower in the police force. All of that was taxpayer money. I mean, it's very clear to everyone. Someone very important is coming to town. Anton City government even hired 12 security guards, formerly special forces soldiers, and martial arts specialists to just patrol the area around this man's house. 24-hour-a-day security. They would even ask anyone that's walking down that street within, like, a block of this man's house for their ID. Just to make sure that they're not someone weird. I mean, you can't tell me that's not the president. Even the residents of Antan are prepping. They're hanging up lights on their balconies. Motion sensor lights. They're installing cameras. Some of them gathered together and held up these massive banners in preparation for the man's arrival. Now, maybe if you don't read Korean, they could be mistaken for welcome signs. But they're not. They read, criminal this Cho Du Sun, leave our city. Castrate him. Cho Du Sun to hell. Only a death sentence will fit a monster like him. Other residents, they locked arms, they hooked their elbows with each other, and they laid down on the streets where the cars were passing to block traffic. Hmm. They did not want this man here. Other locals, they went to the grocery store and they bought eggs and flour, baking flour. There was an overnight rally outside the prison. About 100 individuals were armed and ready with fresh cartons of eggs and they were screaming, why are you protecting the rights of a convict? He needs to die. December 12th, 2020, at 6.45 a.m., it was time. The most well-protected man in South Korea was being released. The prison gates opened. A swarm of police officers rushed out with a man in the center. It was a gray-haired Cho Du Sun. Cho had been prepping for this moment, too. Just like the city, just like the residents, for the past 12 years, he had been preparing. He was obsessed with working out. He could do a 1,000 push-ups in a single hour. He was 68 years old on the day of his release, but his physique, his muscle mass, was more on par with a 30-year-old. A thousand push-ups? In a single hour. That's what I'm saying. What? When his inmates would ask him, why are you working out so hard? He said that he was preparing for this very exact day. The day that he's going to be released. Because what if someone tries to attack him? People were so violent and senseless these days. He was released wearing a ball cap, white face mask, and he was wearing a puffer jacket. He refused to answer any of the civilians or the reporters' questions. He refused to apologize. He just bowed twice silently in front of all the cameras that were shoved in his face. But there was a very interesting detail that is so telling about this whole situation. It isn't the fact that so many police officers were surrounding him. It's not the fact that some of the officers even took an egg to their back because they're somewhat shielding Cho from all of this. It is the fact that in Cho's right hand was a tiny, small tangerine. It's such a small, insignificant fruit. But it just feels so sinister. It feels so nonchalant. Like he just grabbed a piece of fruit on his way out to run errands. Could he really even be thinking about food right now? Later, Cho's probation officer would state that Cho was surprised to see all the people that were greeting him when he was released. He said, I mean, I guess it kind of makes sense, though. 
I committed a crime that would anger both gods and human beings. The day of that crime was December 11th, 2008. So 12 years prior. 8.30 a.m. It's below freezing temperatures in South Korea. 30 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 1 degrees Celsius. It's about the time that kids are rushing to school in their little puffer jackets and their mittens. Adults are commuting to work. And in this quiet alleyway in Ansan City is Cho smoking a cigarette. Now, if you pass by him, you might think maybe he's waiting for someone. It is way too cold to be standing in this windy alleyway smoking a cigarette. It's not even enjoyable. But he's waiting. And he waits until he sees a little girl that is named Nayeong. So Nayeong is not actually her real name. Her identity is very well protected by the South Korean government. And no one's trying to figure out who she is. So she's Nayeong. She's a third grader, probably around three and a half feet tall, very tiny, walking to school. And she's walking quickly because it's cold. He steps in front of her and he says, do you go to this church? Behind him in the alleyway, there's this small church. And it's not like a normal church building. It's one of those black brick buildings. It looks more like, a, like an office building that's been rented and converted into a church, like the type that you would see in major cities. She responds, no, steps to the side to walk around the man. But he grabs her tiny little arm and says, you should go to church. He starts dragging her into this quiet black building. It's completely empty. It's a school day. Nobody who worked at the church had even gotten there yet. It was left unlocked so that worshipers could come in at any time and pray. Without hesitation, Cho drags her up to the second floor bathroom. It is a single toilet private bathroom. There are no stalls. There's no heater turned on. There's this orange brown tile on the ground that's ice cold. He throws her into the bathroom and shuts the door behind him. He forces her to sit on the toilet and tries to essay her by forcing her to perform orally. He pulls down his pants, but Nayoung refuses, and this really angers Cho. He starts leaning down and starts assaulting her tiny little face with his mouth. He starts biting her cheeks in anger, and he's not biting. He's genuinely trying to shred off her cheek fat with his teeth. He tears off enough skin to get to the fatty tissue below the skin. Her face will be scarred. Not all the way down to the muscle. Why is it whenever I try to watch one of these videos on stream, it's the most graphic, like, disturbing stuff? Because this happened last time I watched one. Like... This is just super disturbing. Normally, not all of them are this bad, but just the ones that I choose to watch on stream just seem to be the worst. That's crazy. Okay, it was really bad. It was very bad. <sighs> Nayeong feels the pain of this and she starts screaming for help, and Cho screams at her to shut up and slaps her across the face. Also, I was, it was supposed to be like a mukbang tonight when I watched this. I was supposed to be eating food, but I decided not to go get the food. I'm glad I did it. This would have been not fun. If that doesn't work, he puts his I want to be able to eat. Tiny neck and strangles her until she's unconscious. I want to be able to eat. And then he with this. And violently assaults her from the front and behind. He was so violent that her large intestines were pulled out and were hanging completely out of her body. There were at one point rumors that a plunger was used on her private parts in order to inflict this level of damage, but it was later stated that no, it, it was just the sheer brutality of the assault that caused the injuries. She was completely disemboweled. When he was done, you know, with the bathroom sink, there's a pipe that goes to the wall, and that's where the water comes out of. He disconnected that pipe, so when he turned on the faucet, the water was now just spilling out onto the ground. And it was just splashing on top of eight-year-old Nayong. It was ice-cold water. This was his attempt to get rid of his DNA. And then he left that little eight-year-old girl, unclothed, dying, disemboweled on the cold church bathroom floor. He walked back home. He didn't say a word to his wife. He's married. He went into his room, changed his clothes, threw himself onto his warm, comfortable bed, and he started snoring. He fell asleep in peace, knowing that he would wake up in the comfort of his own bed. While Nayong, she only had a 10% chance of waking up ever again. She would wake up briefly from the cold water splashing on her back. I mean, the water was so cold, it would have been numbing on her skin. And when she looked up, her attacker is gone. I don't know if she could see the extent of her own injuries, if that would register in an eight-year-old sprain. I don't know. But she mustered up all the strength that she had left and started crawling out of that church bathroom. We don't know how loud she could even be after being violently strangled, but she tried her best to call for help. She was out the door and into the hallway with this trail of blood just behind her when a church worker sees her and they start screaming for help. Paramedics rush to the church. They rush baby Nayong to the hospital and it was one of the worst case situations possible. Nayong was now losing consciousness. Her large intestines was dying. So when your organs are exposed to the harsh environment outside of your body, the cells start to die. When this happens, doctors have to amputate and remove the dying organ so that they can try to contain that damage. But that's not the only problem that they're dealing with. There's so many variables. They don't know how long Nayeon was without oxygen to the brain. She had severe damage to 80% of her private parts. She had severe damage to her internal organs. Doctors had to make sure that her small intestines were still intact. Because you can live without your large intestines. You cannot live without your small intestines. Your large intestines are mainly there for water and electrolyte absorption to harden your stool. But your small intestines, that's where you absorb the nutrients for your food. The doctors didn't know if Nayeon's small intestines were also damaged and how badly and to what extent. Additionally, she had several broken bones. She would need life-saving emergency surgery, and the chance of survival, 10%. She would be in that emergency surgery for eight hours. The surgeon would have to cut open her abdomen, a long cut through her chest all the way down to her belly button so that they could operate on all of her internal organs. She was bleeding internally. They had to amputate around 70% of her intestines. The surgery itself is physically traumatic, just adding more injuries onto little Nayong's body. Nayong's parents rushed to the hospital, and they just held on to that 10% chance the whole time that she's being operated on because all they need is that 10%. After eight hours of surgery, Nayong woke up 
and instead of being in the comfort of her own bed like Cho was, she was on the hard hospital bed with machines beeping all around her and a handful of police officers staring down at her. They wanted her to give her statement. The first thing eight-year-old Nayong did after waking up from life-saving surgery was tell the police everything that happened. And I'm sure every second of that was painful. An eight-year-old describing in detail all the horrific things a 57-year-old man did to her, a man older than her own father, that is not a normal conversation. The doctor is then sitting that eight-year-old Nayong down and telling her how her entire life is going to change and how her body no longer works the way it used to because of this man. That is not a normal conversation. Nayong was too young to even spell the names of the surgeries that she received. Nayong's doctors had to amputate a good amount of her large intestines. They had to connect her small intestines to her rectum in hopes that her small intestines would slowly learn to take on the role of her large intestines. And because most of her large intestines were now gone, she would have a stoma. A stoma is a hole in your stomach that doctors create that allow waste, urine, and feces to exit your body through your stomach. So instead of sitting down using a toilet to use the restroom, you would have the stomach opening, and it would be connected to a bag of sorts, like a colostomy bag, and it would empty out on its own. There are no nerve endings in the stoma, so thankfully it shouldn't hurt, but you know, in that same vein, there are no sphincter muscles at the end of a stoma, like you would have in the rectum. So something that a lot of us might take for granted is, you know, when you go out with friends and you're having lunch with them, we can kind of hold our knee to use the restroom, or we can kind of time it so when we get home, that's when we will use it, right? When you have a stoma, there's no warning. There's no way to control it. The waste will just exit the stoma whether you like it or not. Side note, I know that the upside of all of this, the, the hope that we're holding on to is that, yes, she's alive, right? This is very bad, but at least she's alive. But it's not, oh, she's safe now, just one surgery and she's good to go. No, she would need months of intensive treatment to just heal from the surgery, let alone the physical mm. injuries that were inflicted on her by this man. On top of that, she would have to learn how to deal with this completely new life. Patients with a stoma, they need to learn to time it. Depends. They need to learn how to close you are. Because for most people, chewing food when you're in a rush, okay, you chew a little bit less. For people my, with a stoma, my good friends that could mean the difference between a week of pain and being hospitalized Use Russian, but versus like... having a good bowel movement. Because of the yeah. damage done to Nyong's private parts, she was not allowed to sit for more than 10 to 15 minutes at a time. She had to eat less often. She could not snack anymore. She couldn't drink soda or eat her favorite food. Ooh, I mean, she had to unrelenting pain every second of that journey. And every second of this physical healing journey would be unrelenting pain, like excruciating pain. So while it. she's in that hospital bed trying to recover, the police show up with nine pictures. Each of them were of an old, scary looking man. They ask her, which one was the man who attacked you? And she confidently points to one of the pictures and she's like, that's him. That's the man who hurt me. I know this for certain. Because of this, Nayong's Miss Cho Dusun would be arrested on December 13th, 2008, two days after the brutal attack. In Korea, one of the first things that kids are taught, and it, it's kind of random, but it's posture. Have good posture. It's fascinating. Even in elementary schools, you probably won't see teachers in the U.S. correcting students' posture or even mm. disciplining them based on their posture. But in South Korea, very common. Sitting tall with your back straight is not even just considered good. This is different. It's also considered respectful. Not, Slapping not in front of cultures. elders, it's interpreted as you know, respectful. Different. Um, in school, your thought process, because I don't know. Posture can I wouldn't do that. I don't see my friends doing that. Not. And this man's voice was very stern. Sit up. Straighten your back. Mm. Nayong fumbled with her colostomy bag, the bag that catches all her waste and is attached to her stoma on her stomach. The <sighs> hospital didn't have ones for children, so she had to use an adult-sized colostomy bag. It was hanging, peeking out from under her shirt, and it came all the way down to her knees. Because again, this bag was made for adults. It was way too big for her. She fumbled with her bag, and she's wincing as she's trying to sit up straighter. Technically, she's okay, not well, supposed to be sitting for too long. Well, I mean, if that happens... Unless we got it... If that happens, then uh, I understand. Doctor said maybe just 10-15 minutes, and then she has to get up? The prosecutors waited until they were happy with her posture to continue. The prosecutors. This is at court? This is in the prosecutor's office before the trial. That's pretty messed up. Nayong had given her full statement to the police the minute that she woke up from life saving surgery. But the prosecutors, they wanted her to come in Second. and tell them one more time so that they could. Second time? Record it and they could play no, that recording no. in the trial. So she had to start all the way from the beginning in this very scary office with her colostomy bag. She's not allowed to sit for more than 10 15 minutes. And the prosecutor is disciplining her on her posture. Mm. That is crazy. She had to start from the beginning and recount every single detail that she could remember, even the most traumatic parts. Each time, it would take 30 minutes for her to tell the full story. He told me to be quiet in the bathroom, he slapped my face, and then he strangled me. By the end of her story, she would be trembling, shaken up, and re-traumatized, and the prosecutor would correct her posture once more, and then when she was done, he looked down at his recorder. Oh, shoot. I forgot to hit the record button. Okay, that's... let's do it one more time from the top. Yeah, that's messed up. He told me to be quiet in the bathroom, slapped my wow. face, and then strangled me. Damn it, what is wrong with this tape recorder? Okay, let's go back from the top and don't skip any details this time around too. And sit up straight. Oh. This would be the third time. He told me to be quiet in the bathroom, slapped my face, and then strangled me. Oh my goodness, you've got to be kidding me. The recording still didn't work. Okay, again, from the beginning, don't different get a one. the kidnapping as well. Would it look like nothing? Keep in all the details. He told me to be quiet in the bathroom, slapped my face, and then strangled me. Nayong would have to recite exactly what happened to her four times in a row. 
sitting on a hard chair when her doctors advised her to not sit more than 10 minutes at a time, fumbling with her colostomy bag, re-traumatizing herself, bringing her back to the day of the attack over and over and over again with her own words, while the prosecutor is yelling at her, which means sit up straight, straighten your back. What the fuck is wrong with this guy? But at least it's I mean, right? but they, so they far, got to, the police, so they can find a guy. Surgery, and then she just told the prosecutor four times what happened to her. So five but times that's total, and messed up. Done, right? She never has to say it again, right? During the actual trial, the police were in charge of bringing her audio recording to the courthouse so that they could play it for the judge, right? Mm -hmm. They did not bring it on time. I don't know if they were stuck in traffic. I don't know if they were late. I don't know if they forgot. Who knows? So the prosecutor forced Nayong to testify. She would have to traumatically share her story for the sixth time in her own words. She would be yes, there's the prosecutors. They're trying to get her story. I'm trying to record it, audio, like, audio record it. But they just were incompetent and couldn't record it. So she had to redo it so many times. All while, um, pestering her about her posture. Yeah, that's, that's, Forced to sit there with wow. sanitary pads that would be smeared by blood by the end of her testimony because many of her organs were still bleeding. Thankfully, she wasn't forced to be in the same exact room as her attacker Cho, but she could see him, and they could see her. She was placed in the second room in the courthouse, and on the wall, there were two TV screens. One showed the judge, and another showed the defendant, Cho, in real time. Nayong would have to stare at him while she recited all the details of what he did to her, and then in the courtroom, there would be a TV broadcasting Nayong in real time for the judge, the, the lawyers, the audience, the, for all of them to watch. That evening, Nayong went home to write in her diary. Today, a car took me to Seoul for the trial of the man who hurt me. There were two TVs in front of me, one with the judge. On the other, I could see the bad man, and all of a sudden, I was very scared. The psychopathy checklist is a 20-item scale to essentially see how psychopathic someone is. It's a bit of a controversial way of testing someone's psychopathy, but it's used frequently in South Korea. There's two main factors. Factor one is determining emotional detachment of the subject. So do they have superficial charm? Are they manipulative? Do they have an absence of guilt or empathy? Then you have factor two, a measure of antisocial behavior. Are they aggressive, impulsive, irresponsible? There's proneness to boredom. Psychopaths tend to have a low frustration tolerance. Do they live parasitic lifestyles where they leech off of people? The test itself is said to be very intense. In Korea, it is not a multiple choice online test where you have the little bubbles where it's like, do you strongly agree, strongly disagree with this? The psychopath test used by Korean researchers asks inmates who write essays in response to questions, and their responses are analyzed by a panel of psychiatrists to just carefully see what kind of traits they have. An average civilian typically scores around 5 to 6. That range is completely normal. And anything above 25 to 30 is psychopathic. Most inmates in South Korea have an average of 16.4 on the scale. For example, you know the case we recently talked about of the Korean woman who killed a stranger, dismembered her, and tried to dispose of her body in a suitcase because she wanted to experience what oh, it felt like? Too kind of yes. Saying. She scored a 28. Oh my goodness. Cho scored a 29. And his <laughs> wife was going to stay with him knowing that, knowing what he did. He, she stayed with him after his arrest, even finding out the crime that he was accused of doing, which he did. She tried to vouch for him even after his arrest. She told the judge saying that he wasn't, you know, when he wasn't drunk, he was really kind. She said he always did the dishes. He made rice. Sometimes he would make pantan side dishes. He did laundry. He would help clean, you know, and he was very polite. She said, my husband has never been angry. He is praised for being a polite person. I mean, aside from drinking and wandering around, my heart and my family life were truly peaceful. But that's really all she could say about him. Even if there was someone in Cho's life that knew him well, they did not want to stand up for him. And I'm sure, yeah, a lot of it has to do with the fact that why would they stand up for someone that's accused of assaulting an eight-year-old? But also, they genuinely had nothing good to say about this guy. He doesn't know how to keep a job. He has zero work ethic. He's not a great, happy, welcoming person. He used his wife to pay bills. I mean, with that, how do you try to do a character witness for anyone without perjuring yourself? All you could really do is go up on the stand and say, Your Honor, he existed. Like, that is the most neutral statement that you could make without lying. Today's episode is sponsored by Acorns. Acorns helps you automate your teacher's giving money. It pushes today. Green, cool, 30 start. Just to educate your future. Chelsea, so Acorn, PC. But I really don't think that anyone needed the psychopath test to understand that he was a complete psychopath. Even just the way that Cho would look at Nayong's parents during the trial, it was dripping with hatred. And he also tried to gaslight an eight-year-old. He tries to gaslight eight-year-old Nayong during the trial. It is absolutely vile. So Nayong stated countless times to authorities, the attacker was around 40 years old, had thin black hair, a round face, tan skin, tan and thick hands, and a very heavy physique. His voice sounded really heavy, and he did not wear glasses. A bit about this. Cho is 57, but he dyed his hair black just to look younger than his actual age. Nayong mistook him to be in his 40s, which, you know, even without the dyed hair is completely understandable. Like, I have never met a kid that accurately guesses the age of an adult. Most kids I've met claim their parents are 102 years old. But because Nayong said he looked 40 and had black hair, what does he do during the trial? He shows wow. up looking as old as he can. He stopped dyeing his hair, letting all of his white hairs grow out. He's trying his best to cast doubt on Nayong's story and memory. Nayong stated the attacker did not wear glasses. Guess who shows up to court wearing those thick, nearsighted glasses that are typically just used for reading? He loses a bit of weight before the trial. Nayong's My question is, how did he know what, like, she described the person as, the perpetrator as? That shouldn't be, like, public information to her attacker as a heavy physiqued man. The attorney would even point at Cho, and he's like, look at my client. Nayong's testimony is inconsistent with Cho's appearance. But that's also, like, super dumb, you know? It's like, 
he really thinks just by doing that we're gonna buy your story. It's, it's he's like, like, let me change my white shirt to black shirt. Now we don't know who you are. Like it's very it's insulting. Yeah, exactly. And it's very you know it's very like that type of you know behavior. It's yeah. just like, well, <laughs> uh-huh. not you. Even though she clearly identified him in a police lineup as well. Like, it's yeah. crazy. And they were playing very dirty. But fine, you can try all you want, changing your whole look, having your wife vouch for you, but nothing changes the facts. <laughs> Everyone knows what he did. He left a trail of evidence at the crime scene. He thought leaving the water would keep him safe by erasing all the evidence, but it didn't. The police found several fingerprints in the restroom, all leading to Cho. Side note, in South Korea, when you get your ID card, they take a whole palm print. So every single, it's not like the U.S. where not everybody is in the system. Every single person in South Korea, even without a criminal record, is in the system. And the palm print is interesting. So even if you touch something with just the inside of your palm and not your fingers, they can still track it to you. The police ran the prints, and it led to a man named Cho Do Sun. They found CCTV footage from buildings near the church. The man in the footage matched the man in the system. When police went to his house, they found bloody socks and sneakers. The blood type on Cho's clothing was a match for Nyon's. So, yeah, you can try and not dye your hair, but the evidence is the evidence. But psychosis is defined as a severe mental condition in which thought and emotions are so affected that contact is lost with reality. Cho claimed he was in a state of psychosis when he assaulted Nyon. Okay, actually, that was his last version of events. Cho changed his story so many times throughout the trial. The very, very first time that he was questioned by police, he said that he came home after a smoke that morning. He started running the hot water for his wife so that when she got home after working the night shift, she could take a nice, long, hot shower. His alibi was, I was home. I wasn't out of church. I was home being a good husband. But his wife told the authorities that she came home after her night shift. Her husband was not home yet. She hopped in the shower. When she got out, he was home, had went to the room to change, plopped onto the bed without saying a single word to her, and fell asleep. The police caught him in his first lie. So Cho changed his story. He said, actually... What's, what's interesting is, I don't remember a single thing from that morning. So he went from remembering turning on the hot water for his wife, and now he doesn't remember anything. He even brought a 300-page handwritten testimony to court just denying everything. He wrote, Your Honor, people with psychosis often say that it's their own taste, but it's not my taste in dealing with a child in an adult way. An eight-year-old girl in my mind is just a baby girl, and hopefully a sprout, a seed in our country that is yet to bloom. It is absolutely unforgivable for someone to commit violence knowing a child is that young. How can I tell you the truth that this was not me? Exactly. Your Honor, I, I will... That's I will why this story is about to change again. Genitals. To prove to you that it wasn't me. You may be framing me when someone else did this to her. I sincerely hope that you believe in the truth, Your Honor. He's doing the whole, if I'm lying, you can cut off my arm. Well, no, I can't cut off your arm, even though I think you're lying, because I would go to jail for that. It's like a very bizarre trump card to play in a very serious matter. He's insisting that this is not him. He would never do such a thing. He knows his character, and he would hate people that do stuff like this. That was his new story. But eventually, that stops making sense. So then he goes with, okay, fine, you know what? I do remember things. I do. You know, the morning I went to the church building to use the restroom, the bathroom door burst open, and a man oh. rushes out. I saw little eight-year-old Nile. Wait, knock that book on your butts. I need to get some headphones. Probably in a few months. I'll get some wired headphones. On the floor, she's trying to stand up. I'm trying to help her. She just keeps said these earbuds. And you know, I got scared, you know, because I thought if I report this, I will be blamed for this. So I ran off. In his newest story, he is the victim in all of this. There was another man who did all of this and terrified mm -hmm. both Nyong and him. And now he's being framed for this man's crimes. This man kept changing his story based on how he felt the judge was perceiving his excuses. And if information came up to refute his previous statements, he would just come up with a new one. And I don't know how anyone could view him as a credible human being. Meanwhile, Nyong's testimony, on the other hand, never changed. No matter how many times prosecutors and police officers forced her to repeat it, asked her questions, tried to test her credibility, she was absolutely sure of every single detail, even details like how Cho's breath smelled. She said it was a very strong, overpowering cigarette scent. It was foul. And they asked, what other scents were there? Not too much alcohol smell, mainly cigarettes. Cho's ears perked up. So did his attorneys. I think everyone in that courtroom knew what was about to happen, and that was nice. Nayong and that. had done her absolute best to tell the truth. She had been taught since she was a little baby, I mean, she's still a baby, that lying is bad. So she did everything to tell the truth on every little detail that was asked of her in a very traumatic situation six times. But she didn't know that the truth would be used against her and that the justice system was rigged against her. Mm. Cho now had a new story, one that he would stick by, okay? He did do everything. He committed the crime. He did that to Nayong, but he can't be held responsible for it because he was in a state of psychosis. How and why was he in a state of psychosis? Because he was drunk. He argued that being drunk p puts you in a state of temporary psychosis, that when you are drunk, you are unable to make decisions due to your compromised mental and physical state. You are unable to control yourself. You are in a state of psychosis. Okay, if this sounds absolutely unhinged to you, it yeah, is, yeah. but it works. According to Korean Criminal Code, Article 55, Paragraph 1, people with weak abilities due to mental and physical disabilities are subject to a mitigated sentence. And in Korea, being drunk, in the eyes of the law, counts as a mental disability. That's Which means, according to the law, Cho's sentence could be dumb. reduced purely based on the fact that he was drunk. The difference would mean, if he committed this act while he was sober, he could get life imprisonment. If he committed the act while drunk, his sentence would be as little as seven years. 
in what world does being drunk excuse anything or make things less serious? Would you know, like, this logic is so infuriating. When an assaulter is drunk, he is unable to make decisions due to his compromised mental Check this email real quick. Drunk, it's, you probably consented and now you regret it. Next time, don't drink so much because this is your fault. So if this drunk law applies to anybody, I don't think it should apply to anyone. But if it does, it should apply to victims. Unable to make decisions due to compromised mental state. Okay, so if victims are drunk, they are not able to make decisions, meaning they cannot give consent. Mm -hmm. Automatically, if they are drunk, it is essay then. That should be the law then. I don't think I have to tell you all the reasons why this defense being allowed is so horrendous. But let's just do a quick run through. First, being drunk is no excuse. Second, the fact that they are using Nyon's own testimony of saying that she smelled a little bit of alcohol in his breath as proof that he was drunk and should get seven years in prison for his crime, that alone, using her testimony, should be a crime in and of itself. And third, there is no proof that he was drunk that day. There is more proof that he wasn't drunk at all. For example, the location of the crime was a pretty quiet alley. Wait, I missed all that. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Okay, let me go back 30 seconds. Not able to make decisions, meaning they cannot give consent. We hear this ridiculousness. If drunk, it is essay, then. That should be the law then. I don't think I have to tell you all the reasons why this defense being allowed is so horrendous. But let's just do a quick run through. First, being drunk is no excuse. Second, the fact that they are using mm -hmm. Nyon's own testimony of saying that she smelled a little bit of alcohol in his breath as proof that he was drunk and should get seven years in prison for his crime, that alone, using her testimony should be a crime in and of itself. And third, there is no proof that he was drunk that day. There is more proof that he wasn't drunk at all. For example, the location of the crime was a pretty quiet alleyway with not a lot of passerbys during that time frame. People were commuting to work and school, so, I mean, for them to not pass through this alleyway, it's a very specific alleyway. Most alleyways have some action. They have some traffic going on. It seems like he knew that. It seems like Cho conveniently chose this location. Everything mm -hmm. about this location indicated that this was not a spur-of-the-moment crime. It indicated more of a man that was stalking, waiting for the perfect victim. Another supporting fact, most bathrooms in Korea, like major cities, are locked. You have to either be a customer of that establishment or a worker has to unlock the bathroom or they have a keypad. So a lot of churches, they actually have keypads that most of the churchgoers know the password to. This bathroom didn't even have a keypad. Again, that doesn't seem like something that's based off pure chance and luck. The chances are in Antan, more bathrooms are locked yeah, than yeah. unlocked. I'm checking my so email and stuff. I'm getting a new apartment in a few weeks, so no witnesses, and then me and my roommates are one unit restroom without even stalls getting all of the final it seems paperwork like he and that stuff the figured out not gonna be in the church at the time then after the crime he didn't pass out in the bathroom he didn't pass out in the hallway he doesn't stumble drunkenly away from the crime he ducks his head and he quickly makes his way back home and he yeah, tries to remove all the think. evidence from the unconscious victim by pouring ice cold water all over her that is a lot of planning to do if you're blackout drunk even sober every step of this crime would take strong decision making later an inmate that shared the same cell with cho would say that he didn't think that cho was an alcoholic usually you can spot an alcoholic in prison from a mile away it's really easy because there's no alcohol in prison they start having withdrawal their hands start shaking uncontrollably, they start sweating, they can't fall asleep, they start vomiting, they've got these crazy migraines, most of them become hypersensitive to light. The inmate said, Cho is fine. He was reading Oh yeah, thanks for stopping by. Appreciate it. But the problem is, Cho Good luck on your test. evidence to the court that he was drunk the day of the crime. He just needs to prove to the court that he's, quote, just that type of guy. The type of person to get blackout drunk at 8.30 a.m. Even if he wasn't drunk on that day, as long as he can prove that he's the type, he will get a way lesser sentence. To give you context on That's how horrendous so this little loophole in the law is, in December 2007, just a year prior to Nile's attack, two girls in Gangnam were drunk at a club. They get lured to a hotel by two men. These men essay the girls, then call their friends over, hand over the hotel key, and at least another five men come in and essay the woman. All the men who planned and coordinated this group attack and essay, they all stated that they were drunk. They received massively reduced sentences because they weren't in their right minds. They had booked this hotel room in advance. So maybe the plan wasn't to target these two girls specifically, but they had plans to target somebody. But because they were drunk, everything was forgiven. In a lot of cases, the judge will even ask criminals that are on the stand, did you drink? The defendant will excitedly bob their useless heads up and down and sign a petition that says, I drank, I drank. Then the judge will give them a reduced sentence and on to the next case. It's almost like custom. In Korea, 32.4% of criminals who commit essay claim alcohol was their reasoning for their actions. Not moral depravity, just alcohol. It's gotten to the point where in Korea there is a saying, the judges feed the defendants alcohol. There is a movie based off of this case called Wish. So in Korea, it's called Wish. In America, it's called Hope. And it is probably one of the most emotionally gut-wrenching movies out there. It's about a poor family in South Korea with an eight-year-old girl named Wish, Toan. And one day, on Toan's way to school, it's raining. This man comes up to her and asks, can I borrow your umbrella? She tries to avoid him, but he ends up dragging her to a construction site where she is brutally beaten and essayed to the point of death. The premise is very well known. Toan used to be super close with her dad before this, but afterwards, she's so scared of any adult men. He tries to comfort her when she's in the hospital and she has a panic attack. She almost sees the attacker in her father. So Toan's dad has to stay out of her eyesight. He can't even see his own daughter because that's the best way for her to heal. And it's ripping him apart. All he can do is buy one of those giant Kokomon character oh, costumes, dang. like the one that you would see at Disneyland. And he would cheer her up while he's sweating in that costume, pretending to be Kokomon. And inside he would just be crying because he can't be her dad. He can only be this character. That's the only thing that she will see. 
and it's heartbreaking literally on all fronts to see how Tohan has to recover in the movie how her dad has to navigate trying to help his daughter heal while also simultaneously being rejected by her and it's just a gut punch in the end Tohan realizes that it's her dad in the costume a kokomo leaned down and she takes off the head of the costume and it's just her father completely drenched in sweat because there's no ventilation in those costumes teary-eyed and she realizes everything that her dad did for her but there's also a scene in that movie where the judge sentences Tohan's essayer to only 12 years in prison and all hell breaks loose in the courtroom in the movie. So one's mom is screaming at the judge, 12 years, 12 years. Do you know how old my daughter will be in 12 years? And a lot of viewers, they hated that scene in the movie. I mean, they wanted the predator to get life in prison. This is a movie, right? You can write it however you want. Give him, give him the death sentence. Why are we all going home feeling unjust and crying, right? But at least it's just a movie. But art imitates life because Cho was sentenced to just 12 years in prison. It wasn't just in the movie. Nayong's father cried out, if this man cannot distinguish from right or wrong and cannot make decisions, that is the definition of a dead person, someone who does not know what is going on around them. How can you say that he is a dead person? He decided to approach Nayong. He dragged her into the church bathroom and then assaulted her. How can someone who is apparently not in their right senses make all of these decisions? Nayong's father cried that he had to be the one to tell his daughter, his eight-year-old daughter that Cho, the very bad guy that broke the law, the country decided to just give him 12 years. Nayong responded to her dad, too little. Her dad asked her, how long do you think the sentence should have been? 50 years, or better yet, they should stop giving him food. The judge can't make the wrong decision like this. Later, she asked her dad, is this a joke? From a justice standpoint, it is a sick joke. Not only did the brutality and heinous nature of the crime warrant a very harsh punishment, Cho Doosun was not a first time offender. Cho Doosun had a history of 17 criminal offenses. This was his 18th <laughs> Cho's 17 prior criminal offenses what? were not even small minor infractions at that. He was arrested, tried, and convicted prior to all of this of school assault and murder. We're going to get to all of these in a minute. If any single person in that courtroom should have gotten the book thrown at them, it should have been Cho Doosun. Judge Lee, who presided over this case. Well, that's why this video is going to take another hour. Case, Nayong's case, faced a lot of backlash over his decision. I was wondering how was this video is so long. I guess birds of a feather flock together, right? The victim? Yeah. The judge is playing the victim? The judge said, judges are just public servants. As a public official, I am reflecting on the fact that I have not met the public sentiment. And because of that, not just me, but my whole family is suffering a lot from this case. Judge Lee felt like it wasn't his fault that the law was written the way it was written, and that as a judge he has to follow the law. Oh, my head hurts. What? He said, it's not appropriate for the judge to talk about the verdict. If mental and physical weakness is recognized at the investigation stage, there is no way for the judge to change that. The judge claims that he believes his hands are clean and free from guilt because as a judge, he's just following the laws. It's the prosecutor's fault for not applying for an appeal. The public was clearly not happy with his response either because the judge could have just thrown his defense out the window and said, yeah, I don't care if you were drunk. It was really up to the discretion of the judge. Mm -hmm. so they told, like, I'm following the letter of the law. That's not what the letter of the law says. It says you can get a minimum of seven years, but you can still get life imprisonment, even if you're drunk. So I think like it sounded like this drunk drinking was a thing in Korea for so long that people just been applying that to all these heinous crimes and this is just another one of those like oh you're drunk okay fine yeah that's it yeah i think they're just so accustomed to that law which is that they don't even care about what the crime is anymore they're saying it's like a custom like it's a formula you're drunk okay here's a random sentence that means nothing and that's been changed right now right like it's changed or it's barely changing. barely not really. not really there are some like amendments to laws but no uh, i'm gonna hit you with some recent cases soon yeah yeah and a lot of netizens argued, if you want to argue the letter of the law as some excuse for your choice to sentence Cho to 12 years, then let's argue the letter of the law. Why is Cho being charged with essay? This was clearly attempted murder. Inflicting such visually fatal injuries on a child in the harsh winter and leaving cold water running over her unconscious body, you cannot try and argue in any way that you had no idea that this could kill the child. This is a case of attempted murder. How could the judge not see that? And with his criminal record of 17 prior major offenses, how could the judge give him 12 years? What? He's just going to spend 12 years in prison, get out a new man? It is very hard for sex offenders to reform. A Korean news network, NBC, went to interview offenders like Cho. They've committed heinous crimes against children, and now they're free. Did they reform? Did they feel genuine remorse? Maybe if the public could understand them, they could understand what Cho was going to be like when he got out. Side note, when I say these offenders are free, I'm talking they're free. I genuinely mean it. In the United States, about 44 states have a variation of a law called Jessica's Law. The, the law in most states restricts child essayers from living near schools, parks, or anywhere where children can gather together. In Korea, they tried to pass a similar law, but it seems very unlikely to pass because Korea is such a densely populated country. I was going to say, that would be a problem. Like, like, I have better hills to die on than the comfort and rights of child predators. But a researcher at the Korean no, I couldn't see Korea, Korea doing that. Such a law is unrealistic to apply in Korea, especially in Seoul and its surrounding regions, considering that schools, tutoring schools, like those hagwons, kindergartens, child related facilities they're, they're, they're everywhere yeah they argue plus what if the law is abused by some people who would be willing to open a child related facility to make their neighborhood an off-limit zone to ex-convicts again not the hill that i'm trying to die on 
technically, released predators in South Korea can purchase, rent an apartment right next to an elementary school with windows facing directly into the playground if they so wish. And they do. There is an essayer that lives right next to a kindergarten. This is not Cho Soon, but similar crimes. NBC followed him. He stayed home all day and only came out when the playground outside filled up. Yeah. Kids had gotten out of school, they were playing. He would get up on one of the swings and just swing around while staring at the children. Do people not know that's him? No. His previous victims were between 7 to 11 years old. None of the kids there, none of the adults knew that there was a predator, a yeah. pedophile on the playground. NBC tried to talk to him. He was angry. He lashed out. Are you here to let the world know about me or something? I'm already intimidated as it is. Are you trying to tell everyone in the neighborhood? I mean, you know full well how I mean, beautiful my life yeah. is, how people like us live. No freaking way. It gets, people like us? It gets worse. He finally sat down, and this was an anonymous interview, so we don't know what his face looks like, and he opened up to the producers. He has to wear an electronic monitoring device, an ankle bracelet, and he complained about it. He said, even when I put clothing underneath it, it really hurts. Like, to have this heavy thing pressed up on the skin, it's going to start to sag. When I move around, the hard thing, it chafes my skin, and it pokes me, so it gets red, and I get blisters, and it just really hurts. I mean, it's just kind of useless, too. Like, I may be wearing this, but what I realized is it doesn't really have a real effect. I just lower my pants, and I hide it, and you can mess with it and touch it without anyone knowing. The producers were like, whoa, let's bring it back to the crime and the victims. Like, we're here to figure out if this guy is remorseful. And they said, those kids, you scarred those kids for life. And what do you want me to do about it? Oh, I scarred them for life. I should feel pain too. Like, you want me to live like that too? Oh my it doesn't matter to me whether they're hurt or dead. The important thing is I'm not going to suffer more because of them anymore. It's not like they're kind of some grand, beautiful woman or Jesus Christ or anything like that. They're just some ugly kids. No way. But because of them, I'm suffering. It's totally useless. I really picked the worst videos to watch on stream. Did you intentionally try to avoid places with children or minors? Of course, I intentionally avoid all places with minors. I try to avoid those places on purpose because involuntarily, even without noticing, I start having those thoughts again if I'm around. So I avoid them on purpose. He's not telling the truth. They saw him at the playground that day, and the very next day they were watching him, he went straight to the playground. All he does is stare at the children, which is more than enough. Like, put the man back in jail, please. But that's right now. The judge ruled that he is high risk of reoffending. And they're not doing anything about it. NBC went and found. You <laughs> finding out your kid is sitting at the playground and there's someone just standing there. And, and, and the, the dude was like, what can we do, right? Yeah. There's nothing you can do. There's really nothing you can do. If I find out that's a sex offender and I try to warn all the other moms in the neighborhood by yeah. texting that address, I can get sentenced to prison for five years. For? Effectively doxing a predator. Why? Today? Today. What? NBC went and found addresses to high risk offenders against children. Most of them, shockingly or not, live near playgrounds or kindergartens. Currently, statistics show that out of all the children predators released from prison, in Seoul, 88.5% of them live within a half mile radius of a school. You can't tell me that's just a coincidence. An innocent coincidence? Statistics also show when offenders wearing anklets commit crimes again, they happen within a 0.5 mile radius from their house. NBC found another one of those offenders to see if maybe he had remorse. He felt remorse for what he did. He had assaulted an 11 year old when he was like 70 something years old. He is now 80 and he was actually very happy to talk to NBC. His face was blurred, but he wanted to share his story. He said, you know about her, right? Are you talking about the victim? Yeah, the victim. I have a lot to say about her. You know, instead of calling me grandpa, she called me Ajishi, mister. Back when I was 72, she called me Ajishi instead of grandpa. So I thought that was a little strange and I think I lost my mind because of it. She was begging me to do stuff to her. I guess she just had a very, you know, yearning for adult activities. She told you to touch her, the child did. Yes, she would come up to me unbuttoning her clothes. The child in elementary school did that. Yeah, so I did what she wanted me to do. He claims he was the victimized one. I didn't take her for that kind of person, but I think she totally planned everything. I told the police she's a gold digger, a baby gold digger. Did the child, the 11 year old, ask you for money? She didn't ask me for money, but I gave her pocket money, like $2 a day. Anyway, I guess she lives around here because if I go near a subway station, the inklet starts alerting the police and they call me. They call me to keep away from the subway station. <sighs> when I think about it even now, I really just want to kill her. So you harbor some resentment towards the child. Resentment? Did you not hear me? I said I want to kill her. I want to kill her. This is unbelievable. Another tried to argue that That's the child he essayed was wild. basically a young woman at this point. She was like nine. So there wasn't anything unjust about it. He also added, if you keep oppressing us, there are only two things we can do. Either die or go back to prison. Okay, die. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> One profiler who works with offenders, including Cho, said, The thing with these criminals, the one thing that they have in common is they think the cause of their problem lies. We just built one restaurant that we could afford on like our $3 per diem. Like you were living when you went to Taco Bell. Taco Bell. When I see you die, it means you with the victim so even if they're released from prison they blame the victim for causing the problem and they feel wronged they think to themselves i wasn't that bad but they made me out to be this heinous criminal and they maintain this very distorted perception of life a lot of these other offenders have been dubbed in media as chos even though that's not clearly their names because labeling someone as chodusun even though that's not his name tells you all you need to know about this person and what they did 
professor of psychology, Yu Su-jung, said, there are many child offenders like Children's Zone in our country before this case, and it seems like there will be many more after. There are not many, actually very few countries that would allow a child sex offender to return to his place of residence so freely without any special precautions. And it seems very unlikely for someone like Cho to reform. His whole life, 70 years, all he's known is himself and violence. That's all he cares about. Cho had to drop out of sixth grade because he was a raging bully. He never went back to school. That's the extent of his education. At 18, Cho committed his first known crime. He stole a bike. He was caught, but it appears that he really likes theft. He kept stealing. He was very active at one point, lived with multiple women. And like, no judgment on this part if it's not Cho, but I just don't think that everything would have been consensual and everyone was of age, right? I doubt it. Cho was convicted of assaulting one of his roommates. He served a small light prison sentence for it. He was then later arrested of essaying a 19-year-old when he was 31. He was only sentenced to three years in prison for that. When he got out, he married his current wife, known by the media as Miss O, and they had a son. But the son ended up passing away when he was only three months old. And they had a pet Maltese. But he allegedly killed that pet Maltese for peeing on the carpet. It's alleged that Cho threw the Maltese on the ground multiple times and then gouged out its eyes with sticks. He would later allegedly say that he did it because he loved his wife so much. That dog was not peeing on the pee-pee pads, and therefore, that dog was bad for his wife, so he had to kill the dog. Out of love. For his wife. Side note, his wife is 15 years younger than him, and a producer that interviewed people involved in this case stated, it's unclear if Cho's wife is a victim or an enabler or both, so it's very difficult to understand her and her actions, but she has done some really unsavory things with this whole situation. She was visited by an NBC producer before Cho's release, and she screamed through the door, leave, get out. The producer asked, but did you divorce your husband? I didn't divorce him. If he doesn't drink, he's fine at home. The victim li lives nearby. I don't know, okay, and I don't care about anything like that. I don't know anything about it. I don't want to know. I'm not interested. She is still with him to this day. Now, I digress. Then just 13 years before Nyong's attack, Cho was arrested for murder. Almost 13 years on the dot. December 21st, 1995, the attack on Nyong was December 11th, 2008. Cho was 43 years old when he killed someone. He was out drinking with his friends when this 60-year-old man, who was not friends with Cho, is not part of the friend group, made this passing comment at the bar about a past president that he supported. Cho went into this violent, erratic, hysterical temper tantrum, and out of nowhere, he just starts pummeling this old man and would not stop until there was blood and brain matter everywhere. The old man's face was completely disfigured, and he was dead. Cho was only sentenced to five years in prison. Was he drunk? Yeah. And I can't wow. make this up. Just eight days later, the Korean law was reformed, and those convicted of murder would be given life sentences with the possibility of parole. But still, if he had killed this man eight days later, he would have been given a life sentence. Even if later that life sentence was reduced, he would still be in prison on December 11, 2008, and Nyong would not have been attacked. That law went into effect just eight days later, and it did not apply retroactively. So they can't just go in and be like, never mind, Cho, we're going to change it for you too. But I guess even at that time, the new law, it still was not much. The five-year sentence was too long according to the Korean justice system, if you can call it a justice system at that point, because that sentence was then reduced to two years in prison. Cho was released after two years in prison because he was drunk when he killed that man. The same excuse he would use 13 years later. Part of Nyong's therapy was writing in her journal and drawing. It was just a good way for her to process her emotions. Nyong's dad said, Nyong changed a lot since the attack, you know? She's still passionate, still energetic, but there was, you know, that's something that Cho could never take away from her. But that carefree attitude that every child should have the right to have, that every adult on this planet should honestly work collectively to protect, that was gone. And it was very hard for Nyong's parents and Nyong's older sister. They wanted to do everything to help, but sometimes they don't know how to help. Nyong's dad said, my child writes in a diary every day, and I read it secretly sometimes because I just want to know her thoughts. But no matter what happens, she blames herself first. One day I scolded her, and I felt really sorry about it. So I looked at her diary, and I thought that she was gonna write like a normal child. My dad scolded me, so I'm mad. But instead she wrote, even if I were my dad, I would have scolded myself too. Clearly I deserved it. And Nyong's dad's heart is broken for two. I mean, for one, she's so quick to think that things are her fault, and two, she's growing up way too quickly. Kids her age are supposed to be angry when their parents yell at them. They're supposed to not be understanding, and not supposed to be seeing everybody's point of view. They're supposed to be children. Nyong's dad said, until last year, she was a normal elementary school student. But now, it seems like she has the mentality of a college student. And every two weeks, Nyong's dad feels like he has to cut open his own chest and rip out his heart, because every two weeks they have to travel to Seoul. She has her counseling treatments, but also they have to go see a specialized doctor who was working on creating her an artificial anus. Now, side note, he was doing this free of charge. The doctor had heard about the case on the radio and offered up her services. The artificial rectum would hopefully mean that she would not need the colostomy bag anymore. I mean, even that is not easy. The operation should typically only take four hours for most people, but Nyong would need to have multiple surgeries, and the first one lasted over 10 hours. When the doctors opened her up, they realized that her organs were basically tangled. There was a ton of inflammation and scarring inside of her little body. One side of her pelvis had hardened like stone. It was a lot. And even when they were successful at implanting the artificial rectum, she would still need copious amounts of therapy to try and get her own tissues to have that regular bowel movement again. And until then, she would still need her colostomy bag. And family, they don't have a lot of money, especially after taking off time to take care of Nyong. They're barely making ends meet. They don't own a car. So every two weeks, Nyong's dad has to watch Nyong wake up and walk up and down the subway stairs, clutching her giant colostomy bag that hits her knees. And she never complains. She's healing so slowly, but there's healing. Last time Nyong's family shared one of her drawings with the public, it was of Cho in the cell eating a bowl of cockroaches and a hammer on his head. Now she's drawing Spongebob with sunglasses. And Spongebob is smiling, and another one is like a pretty princess with long flowy hair. And they asked her, why the glasses? And Nyong said, oh, I thought if I put glasses on, he would look cooler. So I tried Spongebob with glasses. And the princess, that's me. And Nyong would smile, and the scar on her cheek would grow up. But even going to Seoul to get counseling and medical treatments is a huge stress on Nyong, not just the physical act of getting on the subway and making this very strenuous trek, but for a lot of reasons. Nobody in school, except some of her closest teachers and friends, knew that she is Nyong. From what I can tell, everyone has been incredibly diligent about keeping her identity private because that's what she wishes. But it also poses some difficulty. Nyong has to leave school <coughs> and show up for these random medical treatments, and because everyone in the area knows that a girl around her age is Nyong around this area, sometimes it makes them question, is she Nyong? She wrote in a journal, Today I had to go home early, so I couldn't stay till the end of sixth period. I just went home. I think my friends will think that I'm weird. What am I going to tell them on Monday? That's what I worry about the most. I wish I didn't have to be sick. I regret it a lot. The only people that
but not everyone in this case is evil. All the schools in Anpan, they came together to hold assemblies telling the students to stop talking about who Nayong might be. Parents were instructed to double down. They would bring home their children and they say, we don't know who Nayong is, okay? But how sad would it be if she's your classmate and she heard you talking about who she may or may not be? Nayong's closest friends, they knew what happened to her and they all quietly protected her. These are eight-year-olds. <laughs> they did a better job than the justice system at protecting Nayong. <laughs> Nayong would miss class once. Another classmate asked her, why do you skip school so often? Nayong didn't know what to say, so she started hesitating, and one of her friends stood up. That's why you need to eat all your side dishes and vegetables. This one's a picky eater. She always gets stomach aches and needs to go to the hospital. One of her other friends chimed in, yeah, you need to eat more. Nayong would forever be grateful, because she just felt so protected by them. But they can't protect her from certain things. Nayong's family could only get a built-sized blossomy bag from the hospital. It would reach down to her knees, and it was clearish, so you could see the level of fecal matter in there. You could also see when fecal matter was coming out of her stoma. And Nayong would come home early from school, sometimes because it would fall out, or it would fall off, or sometimes it would overflow onto the ground, and fecal matter would spill everywhere, and Nayong would have to come home early from school. Thankfully, a medical company reached out and promised to send her glossomy bags for as long as she would need, whatever size she would need, child size glossomy bags. But she still had to wash it out. She still had to throw out her own fecal matter. And it's hard. Sometimes it leaks. It's a mess. It's not pleasant because the minute that you unplug it, it's not, it, it leaks down onto your body. So her dad made her this contraption. It's this makeshift funnel, almost like a makeshift sink that flows into the toilet bowl. She can unhook her colostomy bag from her soma, have it flow into this makeshift funnel, and it funnels into the toilet. It matches her height. She has to use it five times a day to empty her bag, clean it, and exchange it for a new bag. And we don't know if Nyong said thank you to her dad, but it's pretty clear that it meant a lot to her. She wrote in her diary, Today I had one of those snack packages with the toys inside. It was my first time assembling a toy like that. I completed it in one try. I did it really well. I constructed it pretty good. I'm just like my dad, so I'm good at making and fixing things. Sorry. <laughs> And I am thankful I was born. But there are things that Nayong can't do anymore, and her dad can't create an invention to solve it. In May, Korea has something called Children's Day. It's this huge celebration in Korea where parents show appreciation to their children. Relatives come over, give the family kids money and gifts. I mean, kids probably love Children's Day more than Christmas. It's a, it's a big deal. Nayong just had a simple wish. Go to the amusement park for Children's Day. When she told her dad that, his heart sank. He could have saved up for a toy. He could have learned how to cook a new dish. But in an amusement park, Nayong's colostomy bag had to be emptied frequently. It made it nearly impossible for her to be outside for long periods of time unless she's at a hospital. But Nayong's dad didn't want to say that, so he tried to cheer her up by ordering her favorite pizza. And she would sit there on the ground staring at her pizza. And they have a really small house. Uh, they don't have space for a dining table, so they have one of those foldable tables that you fold out and put on the ground. And you sit on the ground and eat. And when you're done, you fold it back up and put it away. She wouldn't even make eye contact with her dad. She wouldn't even touch the pizza. He poured her a cup of orange juice. Here, drink this. This is the one that you like. I don't want it. Her dad got up and went to the fridge. Okay, well, how about some yogurt? Why don't you pick one of these to try? She refused to drink any of the ones that he tried to give her. He said, I feel like I'm living with my in-laws right now. Come on, Nayong, do you want to go see a movie? Nayong wouldn't even snort. She wouldn't even look at him. Nayong's dad is so stressed. I mean, it's hard enough to get Nayong to eat as it is. She doesn't absorb nutrients well, and she has to eat three times more than the other kids to grow at the same rate. She was over four feet tall and only weighed 55 pounds. It took him a long time to get a juice in one hand and a slice of pizza in her other hand, and he pulled out a yellow gift box, and her face lit up. What is that? Someone who knew her and knew what she had been through knew that she liked The Simpsons, and they sent her toy sets for Children's Day. Nayong was so happy she spent all day assembling her Simpsons toys on the window in her room. And later, Nayong would actually grow out of Children's Day. She got hit with what her dad calls junior high school student sickness. All of Korea calls it that. It's another word for puberty, when kids don't want to be around their parents anymore. Nayong's dad said, when I come home, she doesn't say anything. No matter how much I ask about her day, it's always yes or no, yes or no. He said, in the past, she followed me around. Daddy, daddy, daddy. But these days, she really likes her friends. This stage is really sad for a lot of parents, but I wonder if there's a twinge of happiness for Nayong's dad because Nayong is now experiencing such a normal stage in childhood, just like all of her friends, the teenage puberty, too cool for her parents' phase. But there is a voice that is lingering in the back of his mind. Psychiatrists have all warned Nayong's parents that puberty can bring back a lot of trauma. Her emotional wounds were healing, but they could burst open again. Because when we hit puberty, we learn a deeper understanding and we will recall feelings and experiences from the past that we tried very hard to suppress. It's a hard time because victims were essayed as a child, they could feel a bit of healing, they could make progress, Th but this could be a huge setback because they're starting to understand what fully happened to them. But Nayong's dad is hopeful. He believes that she's healing slowly, bit by bit, with the help of all the wonderful people in her life. The doctors, even the ones that are not involved in her care anymore, they will jump out of bed and run to Nayong if she needs anything. One police officer who Nayong called Police Officer Unmi, she meets with Nayong frequently to take care of her. Former counselors, attorneys, the CEO of the movie company that produced the movie Ho-Won, that was loosely based off of Nayong's story, they're all part of Nayong's life. And because of that, Nayong does not complain. She wants to grow up and become a doctor. She said that she just wants to help people and this feels like this is where the story should end, right? A child who, against all odds, against the scum of the earth that tried to kill her, goes on this journey of healing and becomes someone that the world is proud of and inspired by. That's the end. That should be the end. So why is this episode not over? Because the real Cho Tsun was set to be released December 13th of 2020. And it was announced that he would be moving back to Antan, the city of the crime and the city where Nayong still lives, the city that she calls home. It is said that his apartment would be half a mile from her family home, a five minute walk. The phrases Cho Tsun's fear started trending in South Korea. People started circulating messages on social media titled, How to Stab Cho Where It Hurts If You Run Into Him. And nothing, nothing is helping ease the public. Psychological experts who worked with Cho diagnosed him as having intermittent explosive disorder, which has been defined as an impulse control disorder characterized by sudden unwanted anger. People with IED can essentially explode into a rage despite lack of apparent provocation or reasoning. There are a lot of people who have this disorder and they work with managing their emotions, trying to identify trigger points. And they can lead very loving, nonviolent lives regardless of their diagnosis, but clearly Cho was not one of them. So this is adding to the anxiety that the general public feel that this man is about to be free. Experts even stated that to make matters worse, it is clear that Cho does not believe there are real consequences to his actions. Imprisonment, the threat of future imprisonment, that's not going to stop him from reoffending. The same profiler who worked with Cho said, someone like Cho, he gets a lot of satisfaction from his actions, not just the act itself, but we believe that he gets satisfaction from watching his victim and the victim's families collapse. The damage done to the victim's life, that is an addiction and a satisfaction for someone like him. Cho was doing a test that measured his likelihood of reoffending, his same offense, and they measured things like family environment, criminal history, employment. It scored
Yeah. But to him, it, it was he was not one of those people because he was blackout drunk and doesn't remember the crime. He also stated to an inmate that he's a scapegoat and there is no real evidence. He's not the one that did this. Yeah. Cho also complained a lot about his circumstances and being in prison. He said, I feel like a bird that wants to fly but is caught in a cage. I yearn for freedom and I count the days until that's possible. Inmates said that while Cho was in prison, he focused a lot on working out. He allegedly told inmates he was terrified that someone was going to attack him when he gets out, so he needs to work out. One commentator said, Why? Why? It's the last <laughs> Why is your body that precious? Is your body more precious than an eight-year-old's body? No matter what, Cho will always care for his own physical body. He will do go to whatever lengths for himself, which is terrifying. Knowing that Cho allegedly told one of the arresting officers later after the trial, I'm going to work out in prison, build up my strength, and I'll see you 12 years later. Allegedly, he would also complain about the food in prison. He would complain that he wasn't getting enough food to bulk up. He would allegedly ask the people serving food, is this food for a human? Why are you giving me such little food? Yeah. And because he was so sick, the inmate said he actually did not get pregnant in prison like a lot of notorious child offenders would. He was kind of the top dog in the prison. When an inmate was asked, why? The inmate said, I don't know, he's been in there a long time, he's old, he's got a dirty looking face, his face is, you know, his hair is white, he doesn't shave. The inmate continued, my first impression of him was that he looked like a violent offender. How do you differentiate between a violent offender just by looking at them? It's in the eyes. You're in prison, you can tell. It's in the eyes. Cho told the other inmates that when he gets out, he wants to sell coffee on the mountainside. I don't know if that means he wants to open up a cafe, that's what it was interpreted as, but either way, it's astonishing that this man is here thinking about his future. But the most terrifying part of all of this is that it says that he is still has a very high sex drive at 68 years old. One psychologist stated he's still excessive in his desires, and those desires are being actively expressed in his behavior. So yes, this does raise a bit of concern. According to an inmate, this is an allegation, but allegedly, Cho would tell his fellow inmates that the electromagnetic waves from the TV and the CCTV cameras were specifically suggestive to him, and he would aggressively self-pleasure himself to those electromagnetic waves. So why can't the government do something? Because he does not sound like he is ready to be a part of society. The best option the government could have done would have been 12 years ago, when Cho tried to use that drunk defense, they could have thrown it out. The prosecutors could butt like hell, tooth and nail to get that defense thrown out. But they didn't. They didn't even appeal when the sentence was given. Now it's too late to appeal his sentence. He cannot be tried again for his crime because that would be against his con constitutional right of double jeopardy. The government cannot now reverse the sentence or add on more years. I mean, there were conversations that he and other offenders should be held in a halfway house outside of prison when their sentence is over. So you stay in there until we are sure that you do not reoffend. But that idea, this bill, has been shut down by human rights activists because they are worried that it would be abused, and criminals could be held indefinitely in that halfway house. The Human Rights Commission of Korea stated detaining an inmate who has already finished their jail term is a violation of a human right. Netizens thought, okay, then what about we chemically castrate him? So in 2011, South Korea enacted a law that allowed judges the power to sentence offenders who attack children under the age of 16 to be chemically castrated. Chemical castration is when you use chemicals or drugs to stop this hormone production. The purpose is to lower libido and sexual activity. It can also be used to treat things like cancer, so it's not just used for like offenders or criminals or anything like that. There's a lot of medical reasons why one might need one. But a lot of countries have talked about chemical castrating for offenders, and it sounds crazy. Chemical castration, like those two words, sound unhinged, but it's really not. Chemical castration is not removing any organs. You're you're just taking chemicals to suppress drive. So it's not even like a one surgery, one shot. It's, it's like a constant. Yes, it's not permanent. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's not a form of sterilization either. You can continue to have children. I mean, generally, chemical castration is reversible when you stop the treatment, when you stop receiving those chemicals. And there are some risks, like increased body fat and reduced bone density and increase in long term risk of cardiovascular disease. But like, birth control probably has the same amount of risks. And compared to the injuries inflicted by Cho, I would say that these side effects seem non existent. But that law was passed in 2011. It does not work retroactively. So no one can force Cho to be chemically castrated. He also cannot be forced to live away from schools like we talked about. In fact, he can't even be forced to live a certain distance away from his victim. He can move half a mile away if he so wishes, which is exactly what he does when he gets out. And side note, this is so angry, but I do think that a lot of city officials, the prosecutor that worked on this case, and someone in Ansan that's making these horrible decisions, they should feel guilt. They should feel shame for the rest of their lives. Get this. Nyon's family were struggling before Nyon's attack. Nyon's dad was a daily worker, meaning he would go out and offer manual labor for the day. If someone needed his services, he would make money. If they didn't, he made no money. And the problem is, at that point, you're so desperate for any money, you just take any amount of work for any low cost. Nyon's mom was a housekeeper and worked random other jobs to put food on the table. They did not have enough money. After the attack, both parents had to quit their jobs to take care of Nyon to make her feel emotionally and mentally secure and to help her physically. Nyon received payments from the Ansan city. Not a lot, okay? Five thousand dollars to help pay for the hospital expenses and other things. But in June 2009, Nyon's health insurance came through and paid the family thirty-two thousand dollars for the attack. The city of Ansan then went to the family and demanded the return of five thousand dollars. What? The city was going to demand full repayment, and if Nyon's family did not pay them back in full, they said that they would stop any and all government assistance payments to Nyon's family. They said it is principal if you have a balance of more than two thousand three hundred dollars in your bank account, you will be excluded from all support by the city. And the family just got paid thirty-two thousand dollars in insurance money. You've got to be shitting me. Angry netizens were the only reason Antan withdrew their letter and continued all government assistance payments to the family again. And the whole thing was ridiculous. The government seemed more than okay with paying so much in taxpayer money to protect Cho and watch over Cho as soon as he got his right to freedom. It's kind of wild. Netizens wrong. said it's like That's he's crazy. an incredible person that we as a society need to protect. He's not even a criminal with a high hope of reforming. From a logical standpoint, this is the worst investment of taxpayer money. That is so f because yes. what is the argument behind protecting him? It's prevention, right? Prevention, yeah. Okay, then why aren't we preventing protecting oh. the victim? No, it's not prevention of Cho's crime. It's prevention of someone committing yes. a crime against Cho. That's what I'm saying. That's the stuff, right? Instead, the same amount of money could totally be spent to protect the people who need to be protected. Yes. Or just at that point, give a million dollars to Nile and her family, yeah. let them move out of the country if they must. Yes. Like, what? Like, that's what I'm saying. Like, they are spending money to prevent a crime from happening against him. Mm -hmm. Why don't we use that money to, to protect the people who has been hurt or could be hurt, like the kids yeah. and the victims? Yes. It's the same logic. It's the same reason you're trying to prevent something from happening, right? He, like, I don't even know how to wrap my head around no. it. The fact that he is one of the most pr well protected men in South Korea. And they're nickel and dining Nile's family for $5,000. It got so bad that in 2009, lawyers from the Korean Bar Association, the Human Rights Committee, filed a lawsuit on behalf of Nyon's family against the state for the way that the prosecutors handled the case. I believe they yeah. received an undisclosed amount of compensation,
A lot of netizens commented, I'm jealous. I don't have money either, but they're not giving me anything. This bastard Tozu-san gets to live and eat off of our tax money? I don't usually swear, but this is unfair. Someone else commented, I can't even receive tax benefits while Tozu-san can receive them and eat well. I can't help but laugh. The government did try to ease the public, and they said, well, Cho is not completely free, guys. We have limitations. He's going to wear GPS-enabled anklet 24-7 for seven years. His address and personal details will be disclosed on a government website for five years. But after that, it will be illegal for citizens to find him after five years and warn friends of his address. Yeah, you could be sentenced to five years in prison. Literally, why? Like, why? Why does it matter five years later? We need to hide where he lives. Like, why? Yeah. Even now, you could be arrested. So, for example, if I told you, if I was a Korean citizen, and I told you where Cho lives, even through a private text message, like a cuckoo talk message, I could be arrested. All I can say right now, even though his address is on the government website as of right now, is, hey, go to the government website to find his address. What? But, like, why can't we just all dox him after oh. five years and then state that we were all drunk? We were in a state of temporary psychosis, of course. Yep. Cho was also assigned a one-on-one -on -one parole officer, and they stated it would be 24 hours surveillance once Cho gets out. Round-the-clock surveillance. And the probation officer is permitted to make random visits to Cho's home. But even the probation officer was interviewed, and he said, there is a real possibility Cho will harm other people. And in that other extreme... Are you looking for good-paying jobs that you can raise... I feel like there's more ads than normal. President Biden... Form of violence. Like on the record, it says I'm supposed to surveil him 24 hours a day, but in reality, when he goes to bed, we can't keep track of that. If he's in his house before bed and drinks, we can't really control that. We are trying to do our best within the frame of the law. And fine, just to wear a GPS tracking ankle bracelet for seven years, but so what? The other offenders that NBC interviewed, they had an ankle bracelet, they were at playgrounds. That doesn't alert anyone of anything, other than maybe where he is, but we don't know where he is, with who he is. He could easily kidnap a kid and bring them into his house. What would the ankle bracelet tell? His probation officer that he's safe at home, that's it. And it's only on for seven years. Cho is prohibited from drinking more than a certain amount of alcohol. His blood alcohol concentration has to stay below 0.03%, which is one drink if you drink it very quickly. But he's not even forbidden to drink, which is wild, considering the whole reason he claims he committed this crime was because he was drunk. But they're like, fine, you can still drink a little bit. He also has a curfew. He cannot leave his house between the hours of 9 p.m. and 6 a.m., which, okay, and what? What is that going to do for anyone? The attack on Nyon happened at 8.30 a.m. I don't know who came up with these type of laws. Yeah. Like, no kids are even outside, typically, at 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. Yeah. This curfew is masquerading as some sort of big prevention tactic, and it's very odd. The whole half-mile radius on Cho's house has also been designated as, quote, I kid you not, a woman's safety area. Wait, what does that mean? There's going to be heightened security presence there. Yeah. So it's safe for women? What is it? That's, I guess, the, the naming of it, but that doesn't, none of this makes sense. First of all, the name is ironic, and second of all, Nyon was a child. Mm. Like, wh what? Clearly, women, full-grown women, are not his target. Mm. And I, nothing is being done to stop his release. He has been released. I mean, nothing was done. I don't want to say nothing so definitively. I'm not an attorney, nor am I part of the government, nor do I know everything that happens behind the scenes. But the citizens, it seems like they're the only ones that tried to prevent Cho's release. They signed a petition. South Korea has a population of around 52 million people, of that like 8 million are children. 1.2 million people signed a petition to keep him in some sort of rehabilitation center after prison. Nothing was done. A professor of the Korean Institute of Criminology said, it's impossible to isolate these criminals from society forever. The criminal system must ensure that they reform when they return. Everybody hates offenders. We all know that. The whole world hates them. But their return is inevitable. They will be back. And Cho Dosun was coming back to Antan, of all places. It doesn't even appear that he has a strong network of friends and family, so why Antan? Like, why come to the place where everyone hates you? I mean, everyone in Korea hates you, but why not just move somewhere quiet? You have no intention of getting a job, you're living on government assistance. Move somewhere quiet and live the rest of your life in solitude and try to find some remorse. Him moving back to Antan feels to citizens and to Nayong's family. Almost like him saying, yeah, and what? What are you going to do about it? Nayong's dad was interviewed by Cho Sun-Yubo, and he said, how can Cho come back to Antan, where his victim lives? I feel like he's trying to retaliate by moving back here. Yeah, totally. To make matters worse, Cho allegedly wrote in multiple letters to the judge that his last request, his last wish, wish, was to meet his victim again. Oh my god, I was so sick and twisted. Yeah. I feel like he knows that the victim would read that or find out about it and it would be traumatizing. Yeah. My gosh. What intention for someone like him to have? Like, he's, he knows what this will do to the victim. Yeah. So he obviously doesn't have the victim's interest in mind. He has his own interest in mind. Which means he gets off yeah. on the victim being in pain. Exactly. So, but he's free. <laughs> it has been 12 years, but Nyon has been on this very slow, painful journey of healing. And it's not just like a one-way road. It never is with trauma. You take three steps forward and 20 steps back. How can the government let this man out? Nyong's dad said, my daughter still has to wear a diaper at home. She has to carry the largest sanitary pads in her bag when we go out. People won't know how we feel as parents if they've never experienced this before. I feel like a sinner who can't even protect their own child, but Cho is coming back near our home. Does that make sense? Nyong only watches cartoons as an adult. She was 20 in 2020 when he was released. She can't watch the news. She can't watch crime thrillers. She will faint if there's any depiction of a assault. But Cho, the monster who claims he's reformed and is remorseful, he wants to move to the town where the crime happened, the city where he knows his victim still lives. Nyong has been here her whole life. Her friends are here. The ones that helped her through all of this, that pulled her up, they're all in Antan. Why should she have to move? It might be the only place in the whole world that she was able to somewhat feel comfortable in. The government offered Nyong's family a smartwatch that will detect the signal if the perpetrator gets close. Her dad said that would just make them more anxious. That's not a way to ease the trauma. He said, mm. if the watch sends an alert to my daughter, she will freak out. Mm. And it will make it easy for people to identify her as the victim of the attack and identify her as Nyong. It's like, like these government officials are so out of touch. It's like, <sighs> like, like, like help because people demand it. But I feel like if that's their it's like they're making every possible wrong decision. Medicines, commenting some enlightening things of when government officials, such as the prosecutor, does such things where you cannot understand it, and it almost feels like they're on the perpetrator's side, it makes you wonder, do they just relate to the perpetrator more for whatever reason? Because I just can't... I, I mean, the, all the netizens are saying, it doesn't matter what political party you're in, Nyong's case, it's a united front as a nation. Yeah. Everyone wants Cho dead, or at least in prison for the rest of his life. So it just mm. it doesn't make sense in people's mind what these government officials are doing. Yeah. There is no logic, there's no rhyme or reason. Yeah. 
At first, when Cho was released, I mean, absolute hell broke loose. There was a squad, probably of 20, 30 police officers surrounding the perimeter of his apartment <gasps> building 24 7 for weeks, months. The crowd chasing after Cho in his government issued vehicle when he was released from prison, like that's special treatment. Usually, prisoners are required to find their own method of transportation back home. The crowd chased after the government vehicle, kicking it. YouTubers went and climbed on top of the government car, jumping on it. They were egging the car. The police had to barricade a whole road from the prison to Cho's house. The car was getting eggs, flowered. Protesters are ordering wrapping noodles to the apartment, trying to pose as food delivery drivers to get into the building to kill Cho. When that failed, they just sat and ate wrapping noodles in front of the cops. Which honestly, the cops probably didn't want to be there in the first place either. Like, I don't think any single cop in their right mind wants to protect Cho. Citizens went around to the back of the building, turned off the gas line into the building. They said, you don't have hot water, you don't have gas to cook with. Some showed up with rocks to throw out his window, others brought frying pans to bang on. It was a literal war zone. At least four people were arrested the first day. They're gonna be facing criminal charges of obstruction of justice, destruction of property, and battery, which I don't tell the judge, but they were drunk. But after a few months, I quieted down, and there were no more angry citizens with cartons of eggs. It was just quiet. Residents don't feel safe in their own city. One resident said, what is the point of installing cameras? Here's what they're saying when they install cameras. If there's an incident, we will deal with it after it happens. Cameras are not about prevention. It's totally useless. The playground doesn't feel like a ghost town. It feels more like an abandoned city's playground. This is a town that has close to 716 residents. Sometimes you hear swings speaking, but it's just the wind. None of the kids are on the playground. It feels like parents are anticipating a monster around every corner. But December 4th, 2023, just a month ago, 9 p.m., the streets of Einstein are quiet, very quiet. Not a single soul goes out at night without a care in the world. I mean, everyone, if they're going out at night, they've got a destination in mind. They're avoiding alleyways. Children have curfews. Everyone except Cho Dusun, because you don't have to be scared of the monsters when you are the monster. December 4th, 2023, 9 p.m., past Cho's curfew. He disappeared from surveillance for 40 minutes. Cho is not allowed to leave his house between the um, there's more ads than normal, I'm sure. I guess there's normally not this. The hours 9 it's crazy. He was missing for 40 minutes between 9.05 p.m. to 9.45 p.m. 40 minutes. You can walk half a mile within 5, 10 minutes, depending on your walking pace. So let's say a mile takes you 15 to 20 minutes to walk. That still leaves Cho with 20 minutes to do something. And remember, Nyong's family home was half a mile away. In 2008, it only took Cho 30 minutes to almost kill Nyong, and then head back home to change and fall asleep. He was out for 40 minutes. At 9.05 p.m., Cho leaves his house. He walks out of the main gate of his apartment, and there's this little booth of police officers set up. They have to have stationed police officers outside 24-7. Okay. He walks up to them, and he starts talking to them. They immediately tell him, go back inside, you're breaking curfew, you're breaking the literal law. But he refuses. He says, I fight with my wife, I just want to cool off. As he's whining, the ankle bracelet activates, and an officer is dispatched to the scene. It takes a full 40 minutes to either persuade, coerce, and encourage Cho to get back into the house. I don't know why force wasn't an option here. Like, he's clearly breaking the law, so I don't know why they couldn't force him physically, but 40 minutes. That they were talking? Yeah. To finally convince him to go back in. This incident happened just over a month ago, and everyone is enraged. They ask, what if Cho didn't walk to the police officers out front? Did they even see him? Yeah. What if he just left somehow? Why is it that children and these parents have to live in fear every day of their lives while he gets to break laws and stroll yeah. out of his house whenever he wants? That sounds like they're enough reason to throw him back in jail. Yes, mm -hmm. but they won't. It also feels like Cho is testing to see what he can get away with. This feels like him pushing the rules, which I wouldn't be surprised, and it works because Cho is an expert at getting what he wants out of the Korean justice system. Netizens are not happy with the incident or the fact that Cho is free. One commented, "Stop giving everyone trouble. Just someone go over there and cut his Achilles heel." He approached the police first. I feel like he's just testing to see if he can get away with it next time. We should not underestimate Cho. If the police had not been there at the post, or if they did see him, he could have done something. Another netizen wrote, That's so crazy. Yeah. It's like, like, you know, most of the time you hear a lot of these police things, like, oh, wow, they're just manhandling you. But over here, they're having a peaceful conversation. Like, yeah. please, please, go back home, please. The prosecutors were yelling at Nyongi to sit up straight. Yeah. And they're like, please, Cho, do us a favor, do us a solid. I swear, sometimes when I research these cases, I feel like evil is rewarded. I don't understand. Other people wrote, I can't believe our tax money goes to this guy for this one devilish criminal. <laughs> Thankfully, Nyongi was safe in those 40 minutes because she no longer lives in Ansan. The family had to move. The family didn't have money. The local community raised $100,000 to give them for all moving costs and just life. Nyong is in college now, so to her college fund as well. It was just incredibly kind, and Nyong and her family were forever grateful. They did not have the resources prior to this, but they're still upset. Nyong's dad said, we didn't want to run. We had no choice. I also wanted to deliver a message that the government did nothing but force the victim to go into hiding. It was our only option to move away. Many years have passed, and still nothing has changed. The burden still falls entirely on the victim. He said that there needs to be much more support for victims. He's scared that there's going to be all this buzz and attention after Cho's release, and it's going to disappear. He said, it'll be more helpful if there's an appointed public official or social worker who can keep in touch with victims. Just once a month, give us a call. We'll feel more secure. All we want is to know that just say to victims, you are not alone, and we support you. That's what victims' families really want to hear. How do you think this makes us as parents feel when your child tells you they're scared and you have to move away? Niall wanted Cho to be in prison for 50 years. Instead, he gets 12, and now he's free, and she's on the run. Parents in Korea say, you know, they, they used to have a saying that you got to enjoy your time with your daughter as a little kid, because once they become a teenager, they don't want to hang out with you anymore. But now knowing that there are more children's homes out there in the world and the justice system is protecting them, a lot of parents say, we want our girls to grow up as quickly as possible. Yeah. There have been some changes made. A bill called the Chodusun Law was passed. It bans SA offenders of minors from going near schools and leaving their homes at night and during hours when students commute to and from school. But that doesn't include hagwons, tutoring centers, parks, the mall, like other places where students gather. The law has also been amended to make it more difficult for defendants to use alcohol intoxication as a defense, but it's still kind of left up to the discretion of the judges. Even in 2019, just a few years ago, a 26 year old male, SA to college student, he claimed he was drunk at the time. He received three years in prison, but even that was reduced to four years of probation outside, free. And even with Cho Dusun being a quote free man, the government keeps making reassurances to the public that he will be closely watched. But now netizens want to know, and then what? We're going to spend all our taxpayer money on trying to prevent Cho Dusun from reoffending. But what about all the other Cho Dusuns? What about all the other children being hurt? How do we prevent all the other offenders from offending and reoffending? Data from the Ministry of Gender Equality and Family revealed that only about half of reported crimes against children 13 or younger resulted in a jail sentence at all. What? With the other remainder receiving a probation or a fine. This is between 2010 and 2015. About 61 percent of jail sentences were around one to five years, and less than 10 percent of jail sentences were more than 10 years. So crazy. And you know,
I mean, I, it's just crazy. A lot of netizens said, and the government wonders why South Korea's birth rate is declining. I mean, there's a huge host of reasons, economic, financial, socioeconomic, but the sentiment applies that, I mean, this is not just South Korea, by the way. This is clearly in the U.S. as well. Why would we want to raise our children in a world that does not protect our children? One netizen commented, I think it's extremely important to note that unsubsidy city funds are literally being thrown away trying to stop a criminal from being a criminal, when it could be used to help a victim and a family have a better chance at life. Another commenter just reads, I hope he dies of COVID-19. Heart emoji. Juicy, what's up? Okay, well. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, do exc exclamation point Pokey start, and it'll give you a starter Pokemon. Then you can catch stuff. When Cho was attacked with a hammer, one comment read, The doctors have told us this is exactly the time to make medical errors. If by mistake you drop the scalpel and cut him in half, this is just a medical error and all the citizens will understand and support you. Another comment reads, There's no way to control someone like him. He's like a fire that needs constant suppression or he will be out of control. And it feels like nothing has changed with him. See what you get. The justice system for the past 12 years. Finnegan. Up another. What are your thoughts? <sighs> well, that was a really heavy video um dang i think that's pretty good one dang so yeah just you, you just missed a really sad and kind of annoying um well not annoying that this was able to happen the true crime case i am going to now switch over to honkai Yes. Let's go go here real quick. Dang. That was really sad. Who was my star? I think my star was a chess pin, if I remember correctly. Yeah, that makes a little more sense. Turn up my desktop audio. Turn this on. This on properties. Uh, let's see. Why is it not picking it up? Exit out real quick. Reopen. Okay. Oh, it's picking up now. Okay, where's my There we go, let me readjust this. Okay, looks like everything's up. Alright. I'm gonna get much more tea. It's getting late. Oops. I'll be back in a second. I'm gonna grab some more tea. We'll grab some more water to steep my tea in.
Plus one, that's a Peter. First, I want to oh no, I'll save that for later. Let's go and do this one. To now. Who will need that help? I have delivered the missive about the meeting. Do you have any questions, Master Dan Hung? I know all that I wish to know. So thank you, Miss Huan Xi. You can just switch back and forth. You need not address me as Miss. I am but one of Miss Bai Lu's maids. Then again, if I may be so bold as to make a humble request. Go ahead. Before this goes ahead. Oh, who might this be? I'm speaking with Master Don Hung. I'm afraid this doesn't involve you. Please take your leave. Hi. She is a close friend. I've invited her along to bear witness. Please, treat her as you would me. Now, what was your request? <sighs> then I hope you don't plan on meeting with Miss Bailu. Please, hear what I have to say. I have good reason to be concerned. Perhaps you should know that Miss Bailu's path to becoming a High Elder was neither in compliance with proper protocol, nor of her own volition. Everything was a result of the stubbornness of her predecessor, Dan Thung. His hubris and tyranny brought about the end of the La Thu's High Elder succession. The preceptors heard of Master Don Hong's return, and were uncertain whether it constituted good or ill fortune. However, many have surmised that the La Thu's High Elder succession tradition will soon be back in force. If true, that is indeed something worth celebrating. Whether we find another suitable candidate in accordance with the laws of our people, or have you take up the position anew, everything can still be mended. Hmm. But if Master Don Hung were to hand everything over to Miss Bai Lu, it could lead to great upheavals on the horizon. No good would come of it for her. Hmm. <laughs> Such a major matter as this is naturally up to the preceptor elders. I couldn't possibly say. I've been a maid here for 12 years now. And was with my mistress every day as she studied. Oh, yeah, I need to switch my category. I witnessed her countless escapes and the inevitable, unwilling returns. As far as the Sienjo is concerned, children like her enjoy mm. a charmed and happy childhood. But as a high elder in nothing but name alone, Miss Bai Lu is highly restricted in her actions and has no freedom or say about her own life. I can't bear it. Your Highness, please think about this poor child. <sighs> Miss Bailu is young 
naive, and easily manipulated by others. I worry that under the pressure of others, she would be convinced into taking up too great a burden. I understand your concern, but I have nothing more to say on the matter at present. Then I will bid my farewell. Master Don Hung, whether you choose to meet Miss Bailu or go with me to see the Preceptor Elders, I will be waiting for you by the ferry leading to Scale Gorge Waterscape. <laughs> I haven't even set eyes on Bailu, and people are already urging me not to meet her. You've been spending too much time with March. You know that I'm a descendant of the Lofu Gudyatara. In Scale Gorge Waterscape, you witnessed my... secret strength, as March would call it. Yet that power stems from Don Fang, my previous incarnation. He altered the process of High Elder succession, plunging everything into catastrophe. Ultimately, he suffered the punishment of molting rebirth. Based mm -hmm. on the physiological principles of Vidyadhara reincarnation, I ought to have been an entirely new entity. And, in view of the law, all crimes from my previous incarnation should have been wiped clean. <sighs> but in reality, I was locked up in the shackling prison at birth. Even after I was released and left the Xianzhou, my High Elder past and Don Fang's enemies pursued me like a haunting shadow. Now, I plan to face that shadow. In order to make amends, I want to repair the Ambrosial Arbor's seal and visit the High Elder to see what more I can do. The Star Skiff is ready. Let's go. Well, nice, we closure on this, which is nice. The tree remained dead for thousands of years, and I figured now's a good time to come home. Cultured people are oh, raw already. Need your extractor cleaned or your... The rumors are true. You really are back. I'm Hila Lu Ying of the Alchemy Commission. I'm a Vidyadara too, as you can see. I'd heard the reincarnation of the great sinner has returned to the Lafu and wanted to offer some advice. Oh? Leave this troubled place immediately. <laughs> I'm not surprised in the slightest. What does the Alchemy Commission want then? Return to being a nameless. Stay out of the High Elder succession. The La Fu Vidyadara have finally recovered from Don Fung's grievous sins. And we're blessed with a compassionate and caring High Elder in Bai Lu. None of this was easy. Your return has stirred up resentment and ambition among the preceptors, and threatens our situation. Uh, I have no intention of threatening Bai Lu's position. You may have a clear conscience, but even so, as long as you remain on the La Fu, invisible forces will try to coerce you. Leave now. It is the best outcome for everyone involved. Do not repeat the mistakes of a past life in this one. Farewell. Such a strong farewell. Excuse me. Are you two on your way to the Alchemy Commission, Del? Alright. Ooh, that's hot. Oh, there's the dude, General. Hello. What brings you two here? The wind and waves are restless around lunar resin depths today. Uh, even you came to dissuade me from visiting the High Elder, General? <laughs> this encounter was not of my making. I've been recuperating in the Alchemy Commission under the Dragon Lady's care. Our paths have merely crossed. 
But your question would suggest that there are others interested in dissuading you from such a venture. Matters that concern the rise and fall of the Viriadora will inevitably attract certain parties. Those that would work circumstances to their advantage. Be it Don Fong, the Preceptors, or the Alchemy Commission that trained the Dragon Lady. Your injury hasn't dulled your instincts, General. The Preceptors and the Commission seem deeply concerned. A chance meeting is a gift from fate. Why don't I help you to fathom their intent, then? <laughs> the power struggle between the Preceptors and their High Elder is a tale as old as time. And someone as powerful as Don Fong, who was completely beyond their control, was enough for them to harbor a hidden rage. The Elders used to have a small say in appointing the new High Elder. Who could have imagined that Don Fong would pick his own successor? And yet, that is precisely what happened. And all they could do was accept the result. Now that Don Hong has arrived, the Elders see yet another chance. How could they let it go? Us outsiders should not judge the laws of the Viriadora. The preceptors have been suppressed for some time now. They will inevitably try to overturn the situation. These people speak of legitimacy. They believe that Bai Lu was chosen as heir apparent by the previous High Elder, and that unless she were to commit a terrible sin, the preceptors should have no right whatsoever to choose again. The healer lady has draconic features, and scarcely believable therapeutic abilities. Some regard this as evidence that she is the High Elder, but the Preceptors are fixated on strength and are unwilling to accept her. Now that Don Fong's reincarnation has shown a command over the vast marine expanse of lunarescent depths, those longing to keep the traditional bequeathal of the High Elder feel increasingly uneasy. After Don Fong's abdication, they fought against the preceptors and saved Bai Lu's dignity. They demonstrated a true devotion. These folks aren't the type to just let it go. It is an internal affair of the Viriaduras. As long as it does not disturb the peace aboard the Lafu, it does not involve the general of the Cloud Knights. Nevertheless, as a friend, let me remind you of one thing. So long as Don Hong and Bai Lu, with their respective High Elder powers and titles, both remain on the Law Fu, the Vidyatara will never cease their internal strife. This is not to say that either of you are to blame. It's getting late. You are headed to repair the Arbor's seal at Scale Gorge Waterscape and visit the High Elder, no? <laughs> Farewell for now. I should start taking this business of rest and recuperation a little more seriously. All right, let's go. easy. Master Don Hong, you're back. Have you made your decision? Will you come with me to meet with the elders first? Or are you set on seeing Miss Vailu? 
Miss Bailu is already waiting at Skill Gorge Waterscape. <sighs> your stubbornness is redolent of your previous incarnation. Sorry, but you're not going anywhere. A criminal who destroyed our succession is unworthy of setting foot in the sacred places of the Vidyatara. Do we already go there, though? Wait. Master Don Hong's presence at Scale Gorge Waterscape has been approved by the six charioteers and the preceptors. He is no longer the criminal he once was. <sighs> Empty rhetoric. There are ways of unearthing his true identity. All right, we fight. And even his reincarnation should answer for the monstrous crimes of the past. The Vidyatara will never accept him. <sighs> All right, let's, let's fight. Come on. Die, Don Fung. Oh, just oh, just me against them. Well then, um. You say Don Fung was merely your previous incarnation. How then do you still possess the power of the High Elder? Oh. That's just two. That's the basic attack. So I can enhance it multiple times. Heaven search. Rise. Cool. Awaken dormant scales. World cleansing dragon. Cool. He's pretty cool. He eats up skill points, though. Thank you for rescuing me, Master Don Hung. They came for me. I... I'm sorry you got dragged into it. It's risky to remain here. We should leave. Master Don Hung, after your meeting, will you go with me to see the elders? <sighs> should I ever want to meet the preceptors, Miss Huan Si? I will ask you to pass on the message. <sighs> I understand. Please alight, your highness. Miss Bailu awaits you at Dragon Vista Rain Hall. It could be dangerous ahead. We should proceed carefully. Oh. Um, I'm level 70 though. Should be fine. And I get Don Hong too. Hitting the wrong buttons. Let me. I've been waiting for you here for ages. Can I restart? I can't. We were met by an assassin on the way over, miss. An assassin? Are you okay? Are you injured? Fortunately, the skills of Master Don Hung and his friends were too much for them. There are those that wish to assassinate Master Don Hung, miss. Presumably to preserve your legitimacy as High Elder. <laughs> I don't care about my legitimacy. Why do they? I told you. Whoever wants to be the High Elder is welcome. I never wanted the title. I am Don Hung. It is an honor to meet you, Miss Bai Lu. You're Don Hung? I heard about how you parted the ancient sea in Scale Gorge Waterscape. <laughs> These assassins have got their work cut out for them. Miss Bai Lu, please don't say things like that. Take a look at you. Dragon horns. Well, they say you're Don Feng's reincarnation. Suppose it must be true then. But you're different from me. Where's your tail? 
succession. I have no intention of getting entangled in that. I'm here to repair the Ambrosial Arbor seal. This is the duty of the lawful Vidyatara. Well, really? Then why'd you come to CB? All I've learned since my hatching rebirth for some medical skills at the Alchemy Commission. I can't repair seals or part the sea like you can. I should take this opportunity to talk with you about the past, Miss Bailu. I've heard about your situation, and while I can't guarantee a solution, I will do my best to improve things for you. Hmm, interesting. You're not like other grown-ups. You say what you think, and you seem trustworthy. So, you want me to go with you to scale Gord's waterscape? Precisely. Let's go then. <sighs> Miss Bailu. Bunchy. Please wait here for me. I'll come back as soon as I can. I've got these two to look after me. Don't worry. Alright, let me reset this so I can do my... Redo the team so I actually have people I can fight. Please alight, your highness. It could be dangerous ahead. Okay, let's do this again. Quick setup. What you, 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 and you confirm. Start. Okay. Now let's just skip this dialogue real fast. Yes. Forming a seal and using their power to curb the spread of the other's roots is an important task entrusted to the Raku's High Elder. <laughs> News to me. The elders must be well aware that I'm not qualified for this position. Which begs the question. Why did Dan Feng choose me all those years ago? That's exactly what I've come to Scale Gorge Waterscape to find out. Among the Vidyatara, the High Elder is the existence closest to the permanence. According to historical records, the High Elder succession involves a secret ritual known as the Transmutation Arcanum, as well as a treasure known as Dragonheart. Once succession is complete, the former High Elder undergoes a hatching rebirth, while the new High Elder begins to display draconic features. However, Don Feng's ritual failed. And his powers remained within me. And if for some reason, it also created you. So, in medical terms, he messed up the prescription. And brought suffering down on himself and just about everyone else in the process. About right. I want to use this opportunity to repair the Ambrosial Arbor seal. And see if I can help recall our memories. Shun the tree's growth. The residual plague, water of the ancient sea. Upon the High Elder's command, subdue the eternal roots. Strange. This is different from the breaking of the seal. Why is there no reaction? What's wrong? Not going to plan, huh? Shun the tree's growth. The residual plague. Shun the tree's growth. The residual plague. Huh. Water of the ancient sea, upon the High Elder's command, subdue the, the eternal roots. So cool. I'll get there. This feeling. So they each have, like, a different part of it. You did it. And this alone should prove to everyone that you are the true High Elder. When the seal was reestablished, did you recall anything? It was like a tide surging through my mind. I became really, really huge and the whole of Scale Gorge Waterscape was responding to my voice, resonating with me. 
<laughs> That's fun. Sanhong, teach me another trick. Let's see if I can remember anything else. <laughs> Wait. Can you feel it? There's someone coming. All right, let's fight. You. Who are you? Protect my loot. Savor it for me. Unnecessary. I'm on guard. The strength. A blade knows no mercy. Awaken dormant scales. World cleansing dragon. Draw some attention away. I sense a storm. I will dispatch you. Commencing research. Oh. So, multiple rounds, there is not. Change. I'm sure there's gonna be multiple fights though. How did they manage to appear right next to us without a sound? They may have used a cloud him to create mist and provide a smoke screen. Uh, I'm afraid this ambush was probably lying in wait for us. <sighs> Seems like some people have had enough of my presence. I'm their target. Why would they come after Bailu? Mm -hmm. We don't know how many there are. Let's get out of here. Go. Look, look at that shadow. Could it be an assassin? Don't worry. Those things aren't hostile. This power. It rivals the tidal forces in Scale Gorge Waterscape. Have you, Danfang? Have you returned? I'm afraid you have the wrong person. These floating shadows are called Mirage Echoes. They are memories of past lives and echoes from the past that the Bidyatara shed during their rebirth. The books say that these mirages only speak to people they can recognize. And the water on their bodies can be used as medicine. <laughs> Seems this mirage mistook me for Don Fung. There's no mistake. This old man would recognize your voice anywhere. <laughs> Have you come to this sacred place to repent? The proud son of the Vidyatara, hero of the High Cloud Quintet. <laughs> you fought with us your whole life. You availed yourself of the transmutation arcanum to summon that draconic abomination and almost laid waste to scale gorge waterscape in the process. So you summoned Bailu? Well, you not or what? Display it, then the abomination would have destroyed the Ambrosial Arbor seal. Tell me, did it sadden you to watch the abomination perish? As the High Elder freed us from the plight of rebirth and set foot on a brand new path. But instead, you were seduced by your reputation and abandoned yourself. You counted the Anjonitas and even short-life species among your friends. The upcoming trial is your final chance. Hand over the secrets of the Transmutation Arcanum now, and the Preceptors can help you keep your secrets. Isn't that draconic abomination you created proof of the transmutation Arcanum's success? Hmm. 
I heard that Don Feng craved the powers of the dragon ancestor along the permanence and created a monstrous dragon like creature. That must be what he's referring to. <laughs> and so the hero of the Xianzhou became its arch villain. Elder, look around you. You've long since reincarnated. What remains here are just the mirages of the waters of the ancient sea. Impossible. I still live. The high elder succession will not be severed in this generation. I don't like this mirage echo. He thought that the Vidyadara was superior to other regions, and that he was superior to other Vidyadara. <laughs> As if the Vidyadara would never progress without their plans. I guess Don Feng probably never told them the secret of the transmutation arcanum. We shouldn't linger here. The assassins are using skilled cloud hymn magic to make themselves invisible. But their presence is all too real. I can, I can see These mirage one right here. Oh, well, you can't see it. It's my face came in a way. If we can center and transmit the echoes, we should be able to detect any assassins hidden beneath the surface of the water. Let's look for mirage echoes and send out pulses. <sighs> Move carefully. Cool. It was obviously right there. That was not great. Okay, so these guys still don't have weakness. Which sucks. Do not fret. Awaken Thorman Scales. World cleansing dragon. Lance ablaze. Lance. Sense a storm. Heaven search. Rise. A blade knows no mercy. Commencing research. I'm on guard. Too little. I fail to send you. The strength. Right, here we go again. Another one. Miss Byron, you fled the Alchemy Commission yet again. How many times have I told you our rules state that? Sorry, I'm sorry. I won't do it again. Wait, I remember that voice. That's the old Chief Alchemist. So she's been reborn. Reborn? More excuses. Who brought you out this time? Is that? Master Don Fong? <laughs> I don't think so. The appearance of the Long Fu's High Elders has been similar through the ages. But there's no mistaking Master Don Fong. Bai Lu, return to the Forbidden Residence. I must speak with Master Don Fong. Oh, okay. Wait, no! You were just a mirage echo! Uh, I got tricked again! Master Don Fong, I finally 
understand your plan. That little girl is the key to the transmutation arcanum. This is a breakthrough for my research. The Vidyatara performs self-reincarnation, but we are unable to reproduce. Natural and artificial disasters inevitably reduce our population. If this continues, one day our noble draconic bloodline will perish, and the fated decree of the permanence will be violated. For this very reason, I have spent my entire life researching ways to free the Vidyatara from the cycle of reincarnation. I have been without success for a long, long time, thinking that this reincarnation had been naught but a waste. But now, you have enlightened me. Don Fung. What did he do? Master Don Fung, your changes to the transmutation arcanum created a draconic abomination that wreaked great destruction. But it also created a new life. This is the hope that will one day allow the Vidyatara to reproduce. Mm. My understanding of reproduction was limited by ordinary notions. How constrained I was! Why should Vidyatara reproduction remain trapped within the confines of our race? To unearth the potential might of Long's blood and incorporate other races into the flesh of the dragon. Isn't that the real meaning behind the transmutation arcanum? The preceptors are too narrow-minded to see your talent. They want to install another high elder. <laughs> Foolish! What does she mean by that? The transmutation arcanum seems to contain a secret that allows the Vidyatara to escape the cycle of reincarnation and return to normal reproduction. <sighs> but that mechanism eludes me. Let's go. Just wait a second, let to recharge. Saw that person, but I'm gonna skip them for now. It's you, Master Dunfong. Why did you disgrace yourself? You were my hero. I, I dreamed of being just like you, of joining the Cloudless. But, but you betrayed the hopes and dreams of the elders. This Mirage Echo. He must be a Cloud Knight who fought alongside Don Fung all those years ago. Not be reincarnated. And I, my leg was torn off by that abomination. Right. Oh, the pain. The doctors at the Alchemy Commission said I have to reincarnate as soon as possible to avoid affecting my immortal life. But my poor comrades have no chance of returning to the ancient sea. You once told us that we should cherish every life cycle and that you would use Cloudian magic to heal our wounds. But in the end, all you did was betray us. I must listen to him very carefully. We cannot afford to miss any information. I will never forgive you. The High Elder's power belongs to the Vidyadara of the Lost Moon. <laughs> you are unworthy. The Vidyadara must not sever the High Elder's succession tradition just because of you. Dunhung, is this the price we pay for bearing the power of the High Elder? Carrying the weight of all these expectations, all this hatred. Before any of this transpires, you have enough time to prepare. This one's over there. Back up there. Uh, let's get there. Let's hope we want to make it through. Awaken the world cleansing dragon. Should have waited. That paradise 
savor it for me. I think something bit me. Your end approaches. You poop. Failed to send you. To travel. Nice teamwork. Lance at the ready. The times are changed. Bailu, are you okay? You were in there for such a long time. Luckily, I had Dan Hung and her to protect me all the way. If anyone's owed a thanks, it's them. I didn't expect those assassins to be so brazen and reckless. Storming a sacred place like Scaleforge Waterscape and pursuing you? Rest assured, Miss Bailu. I'll report them to the elders and round them all up. Fortunately, the three of you were blessed by the gods. If anything had happened to you, it would have been a dereliction of duty on my part. Assassins. None of us mentioned that the danger involved assassins. <laughs> How did you know that? Oh, it's because we were already attacked at the fair, you know? I was just worried that those people would try and attack you again. You said those assassins only came for Mr. Dan Hung. But the ones we met in the ruins were coming for me instead. Oh. Hmm. Perhaps the real dereliction of duty was that not enough happened to you. <laughs> so, did the elders send you to take out the unworthy High Elder? <laughs> that was my idea alone. How could the Preceptors have come up with that? From my perspective, the Vidyadara requires only one High Elder. A second High Elder, one who is weak and useless, must be removed. Whoop. Miss Bailu, our relationship as mistress and maid ends here. Farewell. Now she, she was with it for 12 years, right? That's crazy. Alright, that's two-part battle. Who is... Why is Blade not here? Is Blade dead? That's really bad, actually. Blade didn't go down. Did he? Well, I'm doing this with one person. I mean, one person down. Oh, no, it's dry. Okay, never mind. The story is scripted. Let's just, let's just just heal. Yeah. I'll hold on to that. Then the start of next round, I can release both my ults. I sense a storm.
Yeah, I should probably do this now. Time to show you what's in your prescription. Do not fret. Let me tend your wounds. The times are changed. Actually, I need to heal myself. All right. Okay, nice. That's a, that's a good line. I like that. Awaken dormant scales. World cleansing dragon. <laughs> Lance the blaze. Heal myself. Draw away. That's nice. Oof. Heaven search. Rise. Follow my charge. Mortality means for us. Sent a storm. Heaven search. Break. That should be it. I really like this version of Tonga. Kind of want him. A pity. <laughs> so close. <laughs> Did the preceptors truly believe that nobody knew of their scheme? They should return to their senses. Attacking the Dragon Lady only destroys what little prestige they have remaining. <laughs> the whole thing was planned by me and me alone. Beware of false charges, General. Save your breath. We all know the truth once the Cloud Knights send you to the Ten Lords Commission's judges. <sighs> Too late, Jing Yuan. I go no further. I think she died. Uh, I always felt useless in the eyes of the elders. A false dragon who failed to inherit the power of the High Elder. Today I realize. Any means of vengeance. Not all of the Theodora harbor evil intentions. If you feel uneasy, Dragon Lady, the Seed of Divine Foresight can arrange for you to stay elsewhere. Thank you, General. I'd like to talk more with Dante first. <laughs> Very well. I will await all of you at the fair. The 
The Adara have neither parents nor family members. Once born, the teacher is assigned to instruct the young Vidyadara in the art of Cloudland, as well as various life skills. Sanho, did you have a teacher like that? If you're asking about Vidyadara tradition, I'm afraid that's something I never had any experience of. I've always been a wanderer. I... I can never return to my homeland. In my fragmented dreams, I meet enemies on the battlefield. But in my travels, I meet many people who I can describe with the word teacher. As far back as I can remember, I've had the preceptors and alchemy commission dealers telling me what to do. Cure diseases, save lives. I don't know if that counts as teaching. You know something? It feels like you're the teacher I've been waiting for. Virtuous in the past life. Master in the next life. Perhaps we were friends or disciples in our previous incarnations. <laughs> A friend or disciple of Don Feng? Maybe, Miss Bai Lu. At first, I was worried that your title of High Elder was in name only, and that an absence of true power would eventually put you in grave danger. <laughs> it seems I was overthinking things. You have no shortage of true power. You mean the power to repair the seal? The power you taught me? The Mirage Echoes of Scale Gorge Waterscape mentioned that not only was Don Feng a brave warrior, he could heal others with cloud hen magic. What you have is the power of the High Elder that belongs to you. The power of life that can reforge the Arbor Seal and the vitality of the Eternal Roots. <laughs> it is a world away from my power for destruction. Sanfeng probably had a gentle side to him, too, right? <laughs> Perhaps. Hmm. We should head back to the healer's market. I have other things to do today. Let's go. <sighs> now that the seal is repaired... My affairs on the Xianzhou have drawn to an end. Uh, for the time being. Are you planning on staying on the Lofu? The banishment decree has been revoked, and the preceptors have regained an awareness of the situation. This is your chance to return to your homeland. As a nameless, <laughs> the Express still needs me. Ah. That is a pity. All right. It's another one wrapped up. Let's see what this is. Tomorrow I'll grind more trace materials. Um, and I might do some of those normal missions while oh, I'm at it tomorrow. Not on stream, but like off stream. Um, tomorrow direction, I think I'll watch the next Rotten Mango. Oh, oh there's another one to do. So, well, the, a Rotten Mango video came out today, I think. I watched that one tomorrow. Just like today, I watched that at the beginning of stream, and then I'll go into Honkai afterwards. But the that video is short. I think it's only an hour long, so I have more time to play Honkai. Let me grab this. Hmm. Here. Yeah, I got plenty I can do later. Alright, well, this is where I will end stream for tonight. I'll be back on tomorrow. 
with more all kinds of stuff. Oh, let me get um, put these assignments back out. Excuse me, grab these. All right. See you all next time. Bye bye.